call to order the uh, West Virginia City Council, May 12, 2018. Uh, today's going to be a budget workshop for council, so just remind everybody that this is a, a non-public hearing, not a comment section. So it'll be City Council uh, discussing the budget items between city staff and uh, council members. Uh, with that said, I'll tell you that uh, what I want to accomplish today is um, look at the revenues real quick, see if there's any uh, risk of the revenue line items up or down uh, so we can get past the, the intake of revenues. And then talk about some big items, um, one being the jail discussion. I think we got um, a couple of folks from the Sheriff's Department here. Uh, we'll talk about that. I think that's a good news item. We've got uh, some inmate housing uh, programs being looked at to go to work release. That's potentially going to save the city quite a bit of money. So we're going to talk about that and what contingency we've got to put together to make sure they've got the funds they need maybe to use the um, jail annex and, and do the things needed for that program. So we want to talk about that. Definitely talk about the schools some more, but I think. Uh, when I go through the budget each department, I notice that there are some items in each department that we want to at least address again. Um, we talked a lot about must-haves versus like-to-haves, overtime, travel, things that aren't really necessary that we've got to really uh, look at hard to really need, um, need to budget for those items. Um, and I'll just tell you where my mind's at, and I think Randy knows this, we've talked multiple times, so council knows, my mind is the actual amount in 2016-17. That's the only actual expenditures that we know sitting here, right? We still have to close this year out. So that's really only nine months to 15 months of rear view mirror. So those actuals, in my opinion, we need to try to manage to those as close as we can. We need to manage the, what we were doing back in 2016-17 because we were able to manage the city. We were able to get through the operating um, tasks with those funds and that's what we need to talk about. Um, again, this is not a punitive session, but the budget uh, is getting tougher as we go forward. So uh, we're, we're looking really close at every dollar and uh, everybody needs to understand that. Um, so we don't have any <coughs> sidestepping we can do on dollars. Um, some might think that we're taking dollars and putting it aside in contingency funds. And that's absolutely true because we got some big expenses ahead of us that we got to make sure we can handle when they get here. So, with that said, I'm see if any other council wants to comment. Mr. Mayor, first of all, um, thank you for your comments. Um, Tuesday night at Virginia High School, um, I had an opportunity to listen to, I would use the word advocates, a lot of advocates for the school system. I had an opportunity to actually um, read an editorial from the Herald Courier, which I try to stir from, but I actually kind of agree with the editorial staff at Herald Courier regarding the schools. You know, thoughts are thoughts. Prayerful thoughts lead to good decisions and choices. And in my prayerful thoughts, I had an opportunity, by the way, to speak to Randy Alvis, um, who I think is a fine spokesman for the school system. I also think Mr. Alvis is an advocate for children. And I remember in the Bible, Jesus says he brought the children unto him. He wouldn't let them in some of our schools. He wouldn't ask them to come in some of our schools. And that tells me that this school system deserves three hundred thousand dollars or whatever, and not we have to figure out a way. From my perspective, this is my first comment. We have to find out a way to try and help the school system get a school. That's my first thought, and I will pose any budget that doesn't include that money. Let me say that first thought. Secondly, the teachers, this concerns me, they get, they've asked for, I don't know if it's been appropriated or not, a 2% two, a two pay raise plus step. <clears throat> well, that is one branch of our city employees. The other night at the city um, public hearing, the gentleman, I can't think of his last name, but he ran as a writing candidate and got 300 votes, and I, you know, I thought he was extremely articulate. And he said that 
jobs located in, in areas for two or three different reasons, schools, but safety and health of the citizenry. Well, if teachers get a 2% increase, then I submit that they are no different. If we're going to actually meet the criteria of what we're supposed, our mission is as a city, then I submit to everyone here, in particular my, the members of this council, that some sort of bonus or some sort of reward needs to go to our other public employees. I'm not saying we can necessarily raise the salaries, but our police, our fire, the people that clean our streets in all kinds of weather and so forth and so on, pick up our trash, whether it's snowing outside or whatever, whether it's 85 degrees, 90 degrees outside, if they need to be taken care of. Our firemen who go out on the highways and help with the spills and so forth, dangerous, toxic spills, they need to be shown some appreciation. So let me say this, how do we get there? Well, there's only one way. We have to raise taxes in this city. I'm sorry. If we are going to reward the people that need to be rewarded, if we're going to take care of our students, our children, <clears throat> then we have to raise taxes. Or we have to raise the garbage collection fee. Because anything short of doing those things, I will vote no. Not that I'm any more right than anybody here, but in contemplation and prayer. And I'm not ashamed to say that. The kind that everybody needs to kind of do sometimes on their hands and your knees. Because he will give you the answers. And he's given me my answer. So... That's where I stand, Mr. Mayor. Uh, <clears throat> I agree the school system needs a new school, but Bristol needs to survive. And while if it were just $300,000, probably wouldn't be a big deal, but they actually are also counting on another 250000 in a year and a half or two from now. So we're talking in order to fund this new school, $550,000 a year. A 20-year lease is $11 million. That's to be paid off in the same time frame that we're trying to pay off $110 million bonds that we have currently. So while I'm very much in favor of the new school, I'm not in favor of it now. Uh, in a couple of years, if the falls is doing what it's supposed to do and various other things come online, we can certainly visit it. I personally haven't seen enough information on the school to even know exactly if they know what they're doing, 100%. I know they're 100% behind it, and I am too, but I want to see all the details. And I haven't seen those. But even if I have seen them, this year, I can't vote to do that. And that 300000 there's been a misconception that $300,000 is supposed to come out of school operations. They were just going to put that money away for the new school. So the reality is it's up to them to decide how they want to spend that money. But they do not have to cut programs that they currently have on books. So, I mean, it would say... That's the way everybody thought it was going to happen in the public. I hope we cut that. They're going to have to cut programs and athletics to be impacted and all this other junk. Uh, that's not the case, unless they choose to do it that way. But uh, as much as I want to have them help them to do a new school, we can't do it without a substantial tax increase, which Mr. Flinger is alluding to. My calculation just on his comments we're looking at six cents minimum for the property tax increase that's a six hundred thousand dollar increase that would cover the school and their plans but can the citizens afford that we're already looking at four dollar increase on the collection fee for the garbage so that's forty uh, <coughs> 
forty-eight dollars more a year on top of more property tax. I mean, if that's what council wants, that's what we're going to have to do in order to do it. Otherwise, there's no way we can support building a new school at this time. In a couple of years, things can change. And, you know, there's this program that they have available public private is going to be around in two years or three. So it's not like it's going to go away if we don't jump on it now. That's, that's all I have to say. Well, my comments are uh, <clears throat> we just have to keep in mind that we need to do everything we can to make sure that we prepare ourselves to meet our financial obligations and we got to look at our obstacles of what we're facing today and the trend is we are a declining population last year we was over seventeen thousand, and now we're in the high sixteen thousand. last year we sat here with 22 percent poverty this year we sit here with 23.7 percent poverty our trends are not looking good and until we can figure out a way to get the jobs in here that can put the people back to work at a decent salary the retail the restaurants they're not going to make a living they're going to keep struggling and we're going to keep heading in that opposite trend that we need to head in we have got to figure out how to get this city going again with viable jobs that can support a family to where people will be willing to move back in here and when they get out of high school and go off to college if they do so we've got a job for them to come back to the trend has been for the last 20 plus years that i'm aware of our kids our graduates have not been coming back because all of our industry all of our good paying jobs have left us and until we get the ear of Richmond and get them to understand what the situation truly is down here, we're at the mercy of doing what we can as a community. So what can we do as a community? We have to work together. We have to keep talking to one another all the parents and the teachers and the taxpayers they need to get involved with budgets of what is the school system doing with the funds that they're given what is council doing with the funds and allocating to all these other entities people needs to be involved i have said it since i've been on council it's going to take this whole entire city to get us through this and if we work together we can do it but if we're in opposition fighting for a single cause, it's just going to make the task that much more difficult. Number one, in my opinion, we need to survive as a city. And the city's job is to keep everything fully functional and intact. It's not going to be at the levels we've been accustomed to because of the decline in population and growing in poverty. And we're going to talk about the jail situation here in a minute. But poverty breeds crime. And crime is what fills our jails up. We have got to get the message out in this community that they have another option. And we have got to strive to give them that other option. And jobs is what that option needs to be, a future in this city. <coughs> it's not that we want to sit up here and cut and slash. None of us wants to do that. But the bottom line is every household has a budget that they have to live under. And this city has a budget it has to live under. Sure, we can raise taxes, but we're already declining. So what's going to be the cause and effect of that? More people's going to leave. Everything has to be thought out from the beginning to the end. Because once you do something, the unintended consequences is going to follow. So we have to be very careful. And that's my input on that. <clears throat> well, um, first off, uh, 
there's parts of what all of y'all have said that I agree with and some I disagree with, but you know, I would say I thank everyone for the last two meetings that came out. You mentioned involvement, and I think we, ever since I've been on council, I think all of us, everybody since we've been on council has talked about the need for involvement, and I was thinking that's probably the most people I've seen in this room. I don't think I've ever seen it where we had to have 80 people out there in overflow. And so, you know, if we're going to get people involved, I think, you know, one of the things is we need to, to listen to them and, and go back and get some of this a second look. Is it easy? No. Uh, you know, and as, as Doug said, you know, I would argue that education is an investment. It's an investment in our future. And the problems we're talking about, you know, I've heard people talk about, you know, emotion versus facts, and, and they may be emotional, but it's personal. I would say if I wasn't up here, I might be down there arguing the same thing because this is our children, uh, and, uh, you know, parents take that personal. Uh, but I don't think it's all emotional. But when you look at the facts, poverty, and you mentioned that, what's the number one thing that correlates with poverty? Educational opportunity. So if we can have strong schools, then you know that works. What's the number one predictor of, of young people if they're going to be in jail? Third grade reading rates. If they can read at grade level, that's the number one predictor of, of how they determine you know jails and things like that. So again, all of this ties back to education. We talked about jobs, and we need to have. A discussion about jobs and, and I know the city managers working on some things but but what's our strategy how are we going to go forward and get the public involved because over the past few weeks um, during the campaign and some other things I've had some opportunities to talk to uh, a lot of different people and some business people and I think they want to get involved but we you know we need to come up with here's some ideas what do you think and get them behind our ideas because they can maybe help make some of those contacts in Richmond or other places we need. But we got to tell them, here's the direction we're going, not just, well, where are we going? We don't know. I mean, we have to, to have some discussion on our, our end about that. But, you know, when you look at jobs, and we need the jobs, we need good jobs to keep families here because you're right, the trend of population all through Southwest Virginia is going down. It's as low as, I think, uh, about a half a percent in Washington County to as much as 8% up in Buchanan County. I mean, it, it's going down. So these are jobs, not just for Bristol, but for the region. But if you look at the patterns and look at the census data and commuting patterns, jobs in this region, if we bring a job to Bristol, that doesn't mean this person's going to live in the city. doesn't mean they're going to shop in the city. So that's where we need you know, people to live here to, to uh, invest in our city, to buy goods in our city, to pay real estate taxes in our city. What's going to be the one thing that's going to make them determine whether I want to live in Bristol, Tennessee, Sullivan County, Washington County versus Bristol, Virginia? If they've got children, they're going to look at the school system. You know, even if they don't have children, they're probably going to look and say, you know, they've got a new school there. That's going to help make the value of my home a little more because it's in a district with a brand new school versus the other ones over here. So in a lot of ways, I think, you know, if you look at education as an investment, over time, we'll, we'll see some of that return. You won't see it immediately. You won't see it in terms of dollars, but you will see it over time. Uh, I agree with Mr. Planner. We need to invest in our employees. Yes, sir. And, and, and yes, sir. that was one thing that troubles me in this, and I don't know how we solve book problems in one year without, as Mr. Hubbard says, a huge tax increase. I think you probably could solve um, education without the garbage fees and some other ways, and I, I just say I prefer that because uh, that solves another problem with the landfill, which is something we continually, for years, and it's on all the audits, the APA, so we're solving two problems which is good, rather than creating more. Um, regarding the new school, you know, they, they, again, um, that's up to the school board, the location, the what it is. I mean, when it comes to us, it's just about financing. But if we don't use this alternative method of financing it, I see no way in the next, Dr. Perrigan said 20 years, I think it's probably more closer to 
well, that we could pay for a school uh, using traditional methods. And so you've got a whole generation of students that start in first grade that will have to wait that long before they get a new school. And in the meantime, these buildings are getting older. They're going to have maintenance, and we're going to have to pay for that over that period of time. Plus, as if we do, as some have said, close down Highland View, and again, I, I went there, my kids go there. It's an old school. It needs a lot of work. But, you know, if you were to close it down, that creates a whole host of problems for families, as well as then now we've got a building that we've got to figure out a use for or tear down. Because you cannot let that building sit there in that neighborhood uh, without some very bad consequences happening. So again, looking forward, the new school route is the best way. But if you take this 300,000 out, will it be the death of the schools? No. But if we're going to try in good faith to, to, to help with this new school, we're already, even if we leave the 300,000, at a quarter of a million dollar deficit in a couple of years. So that's going to probably be a tax increase, which is one reason I don't want one now. Maybe not, but it, you might have to. But if you get down to coming up with a half a million, because that would be at the exact same time the bond payments ramp up, it, it almost becomes virtually impossible. So, you know, both because of the short and the long term things, I think. If, we can cut as much funding as we can put to the school will help us out. So, uh, and I'll add more to that, I'm sure, as we go along, but that's kind of where I look at all this. Mr. Harley, you agree? I think I've heard you say this too. You think we need to do something for our employees and not just one group or category of employees, all our employees, even if it's a one time bonus or something this year. We need to find the money. They earned it. They earned no, it. No, I, well, I don't disagree with that. And, and like I say, I think. You know, I, that's going to be hard to find, I think, in the budget because that's a recurring thing. But if something happens and we get some one time money or, or we can find it, then yeah, because one, I mean, this year, uh, you know, just like the school system, the reason they're wanting to give the teachers raises is they're seeing people leave. We're, you know, we haven't given our employees raises. In fact, this year they're paying more for their insurance. Over time, again, if you look at it as an investment, if you want it to get people and, and they, they work hard, they should be rewarded, and you want to keep them here, then you, you can't continue to, to not give them raises and ask more and more of them on the insurance side. Because in, in, in reality, by not giving them a raise and, and then asking them to pay more insurance, you're, you're reducing the take, net take home. And after a while, I mean, they may love their job, the only people you'll get to stay are people that are like, I'm going to, talk to, to you know, I'm 15 years vested in VRS, I got five to go. I'm 18 years vested in VRS, I got two to go. I mean, that's that's the mentality you're going to end up having. Um, and the people that come in, new, they'll take, they'll work for two or three years and get some experience and move on. So you become a, a, a training ground and you don't have any continuity. So yeah, we need to to do that. I'm not sure how you do that in the education this year, but, but I think going forward that's definitely something I would say we should look at. Alright, well let me uh, wrap up kind of a summary then hearing all the input here. Just kind of give you my take on everything that's transpired over the last couple of weeks. You know, the input over the last public hearing and you know, here in City Council Chambers has been good. A lot, a lot of people came in, a lot of people commented on on the schools and the items, right? But what we need is not people at the podium, right? I mean, you can come in here and talk at the podium about what your position is. What we need is the community to really get together and <coughs> get into the details, get some work groups together and really look at what do we need to do with the school system? You know, what, what does the community look at as far as the options we need to consider? So we had a separate meeting with the, uh, with the superintendent and a couple uh, board members uh, after the public hearing. And you know, my message to them was pretty simple. It was like, I'm not, I'm not sitting here for or against a new school. I just want to make sure that we look at these things very closely. Because you're talking about a major decision when you're talking about a new school. You're talking about a long-term financial commitment, a long-term commitment to the, to the school system and some 
large shifts in the way you're doing things now. So you need to look at this really close. This is not a decision that you just lightly go forward. So we need people to come together to look at all the options. Because from where I sit, we haven't seen all the options. We've heard the public-private option, you know, for private money funding a new school. But in the same breath, we all know new school construction costs, and you get private investors involved, the quality of that construction can be not what you desire. So they're looking to make money on that investment. So you've got to be really careful, you know, which path you take. So some other options we have, we have assets of the school system today, buildings that are pretty solidly constructed. So what are the options we could use to use the current assets we've got, maybe at least for a few years, right, to give us time to get our finances further along so we're in a better position to do something about a new school or maybe even have the funds to modify one of the schools. So I'm not seeing those options. So I'm challenging the superintendent and the, and the school system to, you know, look at all the options, be very unbiased and look at every option in detail you know, not on the surface, in detail. You know, how many students do you have in each school? How many teachers? What's the classroom ratio? What's the state allowing the classroom ratios? Which schools are doing the best in the city as far as their their grades on three, four, and five, you know, standardized testing? You know, how can we how can we use what we have and come up with a better formula, at least in the short term, to get us to where we need to? Because I, I told him, and I'll be transparent about it, I said, you, we cannot think budget neutral. They said, okay, this school project is a budget neutral project. Well, we cannot think budget neutral. Budget neutral means we're no more down the path of being financially stable than we are sitting here. It's got to be a project that really helps this city from a cost financial standpoint, right? Budget neutral doesn't get us there. And education is an investment, but there's other ways of doing it. So I just think it's a, I just think it's a discussion that's got to be studied further. I think 300,000, it was mentioned more than once, is not anything that they can't deal with. Um, and I'll say it once again, I don't view the 300K as a cut. It's not a cut. The state actually takes an index. That's where you got to get into details. The state has an index, right? They look at all the communities and their ability to pay for education. So they look at real estate assessed value, the poverty level, the per capita income, and they come up with a formula and they say this community is only able to pay this amount for education. So therefore the state puts in a bigger portion when that community doesn't have the ability to pay. So that's why you see places like Bristol, Virginia getting more money than places like Alexandria, Virginia. So the index changed. So what's not being said in the public domain is our <coughs> index actually went in the direction of the state put in more money. Right? So they're actually getting more money not less. The dollars are up. Nine hundred plus thousand dollars has come to the school system. So that, and, and, and the effect of that is that means the locality doesn't have to put in as much. And the, and the message there is the state saying we're putting in more because we see you as a community not having the ability to pay. And that's why that index works that way. The other thing you got to look at the details is these reports that the superintendent of schools put to the state level. This is about every, every county, every city in the state. How many pupils, how many tax dollars go toward education? So it's really easy to put it on a per, per student basis. So you divide how much tax dollars Bristol Virginia puts in and how much we're spending on a per student basis. So you're going to be surprised when you look at that. I was surprised when I looked at that. We're actually putting in more per student than other places similar to us. Like <coughs> and Galax and other communities that are poor like us. So we need to understand that. We need to understand, are we really putting together the education dollars for a community like us that's fair, reasonable, and it's going to get the investment we need in education? So there's a lot more to talk about there than just increasing taxes. I don't think increasing taxes is, is the answer. I think, that's a, I think that's maybe what we have to do. But like Mr. Wingard said and some others, I think I've said it, our number one priority is to make sure this city's in a position in the next four to six years to still be a city and still pay its bills. And that's the only reason I'm sitting here. So I look at it as a holistic problem. And so every department, education, public safety, has to be part of, has to be part of that solution. So if we need to put a short-term plan together that's better than a new school that gets us where we need to be as a city, as a team, as a city, as a team, then that's what we need to do. So that's the way I'm looking at it. 
So I don't want to go up or down or cut any particular apartments. But the job one is to make sure the city's in the right position it needs to be when we got to pay our bills. And because those bills are not going to go away, no matter how much we debate it in this room, they're not going to go away. So if we have to increase our tax rate and do nothing different, you're going to be surprised what the real estate tax rate is seven years from now. I mean, it's going to be tremendous in order to pay our bills. It's not a little number. So, so that's all I want to say. I think we've got to keep an open mind. I think we need people involved in a detailed manner. And uh, I think we can get through this and um, move to where we need to. Sorry, with that, City Manager. Three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> if you all spent 33 minutes on philosophical topics, I think we just spent another 32,000 minutes and probably spent the same place in the devolved minutes. So I'll take one more three minutes. Uh, I'll be like this morning, I'll have more gap. Very good to have the uh, presentation. Uh, gentlemen, I've got about 18 slides here that goes to a variety of different topics. I think each uh, topic we have discussed uh, this morning. Uh, I would ask, I know you want to have questions about each one of these topics, but the sooner I get through these, I think we can get to where we need to be uh, sooner rather than later today. Most of the answers with some of the topics y'all discussed will find in these slides. Let's do another quick overview, maybe. Uh, here's our agenda for today. I'm going to do a budget summary, revenue review, expenditure summary, then we'll talk about the items of interest. And these, these items of interest are items of interest that I have um, developed over the past few weeks after having discussions and emails amongst all of you all. Uh, school funding is an issue, overtime is an issue, outside agency funding is an issue, and the other one is jail overcrowding. So here's our budget summary. Our general fund revenue is $51.5 million. Uh, we have gone back over these revenues. I do not feel comfortable thinking that we can adjust those revenues um, up at this point based on the historical analysis. I think the mayor's right where actuals um, are from the 16, 17 years. So when you look at what our actuals have been, uh, not only in 16, 17, but years previous, I think that revenue is in line with where we need to be at this point. If at the end of the day that revenue line item uh, is greater in fiscal year 18-19, great. Uh, it means we did our job and we um, actually, based on actuals, and we've had some growth within the city if things increase. Solid waste disposal fund is 5.5 million. Uh, there was a decrease uh, in that revenue this year simply because without the collection rate increase, I should say. Um, and that's all based on actuals as well. Capital projects is 11.6 million. 301,000 of that is local funds, and that's a transfer from uh, the general fund into the capital project fund. It's not a true revenue to the capital project fund. So total, uh, this year we have a $68.8 million budget. <coughs> Here's our revenue from local sources. Uh, as you can see, it was about a half a million dollar decrease from local sources. I honestly think that's in line with where we need to be based on historical analysis of the numbers. Revenue from the Commonwealth has increased slightly, uh, close to half a million. Revenue from the federal government has increased as well. Our um, capital project fund, you can see um, it's increased by 1.7 million this year. Uh, you do not see a number uh, total revenue from local sources because there's really not any revenue from local sources. That is just a transfer from the general fund, which is included in the 1.25 million under total other financing sources. So what changes in expenditures? In information technology, uh, we will be implementing Kronos and the supplies that go along um, and other supplies that IP needs in order to properly uh, run this city. Everything is based on some sort of informational technology nowadays and we need to be planning for um, to, to get these uh, supplies that we need so we can operate effectively. 
Uh, we've reduced the full-time employee with the police department. Fire department has been reduced by two full-time employees. The sheriff's department, we increased in this budget year by $300,000, um, the budget for inmate housing. Animal control, we're having to add a employee and a half uh, and the shelter costs. The shelter costs should be absorbed in fiscal year um, 18 and not the upcoming fiscal year. Streets and engineering, uh, four full-time employee positions have been um, eliminated, but that, those funds have been put into contract <coughs> over. That way, if they do need uh, extra help on certain projects, there's a, they do have contract labor funds available in contract labor in order to do those projects. Uh, reduce the local funding for schools and social services. We've eliminated three park and recs full-time employees. Uh, expenditures this year also included uh, salary for a director of economic development. Uh, the debt service includes payments and the refinance savings and we've transferred to solid waste um, was reduced by the collection rate increase of four dollars. Now we'll talk about schools. I know this has been a big topic. I want to try to get some data together for council in order uh, so we can see exactly what we're dealing with. Elementary includes pre-K. There's a total of 1,105 students. And by the way, council, I emailed this presentation to you all last night. Um, there's 1,105 students. Uh, there's a total of 61 teachers, which is an 18 to 1 student ratio. In middle school, there's 508 students. Uh, total teachers is 40, which is a 12 to 1 ratio. High school is 639 students with 49 teachers is a 13.04 ratio. Uh, if you want to take the total ratio, I think that still equates to about an 18 to 1 ratio for the city uh, for total students. Here's a required local effort. When you go back and look at past fiscal years and what we have budgeted this coming year, uh, I did not include this upcoming fiscal year simply because uh, we uh, getting the, the exact number for required local effort and local match has been a little difficult. So you can see the required local effort in fiscal year 15 was 4.2. In 16, it dropped down to 4.1. It's about a $40,000 drop. And in 17, it uh, creeped back up to about an additional $60,000. And then once again, it dropped off again in uh, fiscal year 18. Our required local match has stayed steady the past three years at roughly $580,000. Uh, the debt service for the school system has stayed uh, constant at $865,000 to $870,000. So a total that has been budgeted for each of those years is roughly $5.6 million. However, over those same years, we have uh, added additional local funds. So we have funded the school system at roughly 3% over the <coughs> local uh, funding requirements by 21% over each one of these years, or I'm sorry, 23%. Here's the school revenue trend. Um, you can see that the state has <coughs> increased since fiscal year 15. Their um, per pupil spending per source. Our local has decreased slightly, but overall it's a flat, flat line. And then our federal government has decreased as well since fiscal year 13. However, it seems to be on the <coughs> uptick at the moment. Here's just another graph showing uh, total revenue trends. You can see in fiscal year 13, 14.6 million was from state sources. And since uh, over the past uh, six years, that has increased to 16.1 million. So roughly one and a half million dollars uh, of funding has been increased um, from the state to local, to the schools. Here's our locality comparisons. Um, the LCI, the mayor is uh, correct. There is a formula that is used in order to determine the locality's ability to pay, and that's based on your uh, uh, real property value, your gross income, and your real or your sales tax within the city. And as you can see, we rank uh, number three on this list behind Stanton and Waynesboro for our ability to pay, and Radford and Martinsville fall below us. This is the school funding as a percent of the city budget. Over uh, 
if when you do the locality comparisons, it appears that we're at twelve and a half percent of the school's budget. Other localities uh, is a little bit uh, more significant than the city of Bristol's. Percent of the general fund, our general fund supporting the schools, we're <coughs> roughly uh, twenty-five percent of our of the funds support the schools, support the schools budget. And that's on par with Martinsville and Radford, Stanton and Waynesboro, which had a higher LCI than we we do, is at 35 and 37 percent. Employee overtime. Uh, this has been a discussion over over the um, as I did an analysis of the overtime. It appears there's about 251 thousand dollars of overtime that is budgeted throughout the city and departments. Uh, it, Based on conversations that we've had, we may need to tighten up on the overtime and have some sort of approval process in place in order for these departments to use the overtime, look at scheduling to determine how we can better schedule employees so that we don't have um, as much spend in overtime as we have in years past. You can see what we proposed was um, the left-hand column under the proposed budget is what we proposed for this year. The right-hand column is the alternative option, which basically I've reduced uh, each department's overtime by 50%, still allowing them to have some overtime, but then we would eventually move those dollars into the contingency fund, and we would have some sort of approval process in place for that. So there would be a savings of $121,400 by moving that to the contingency fund. Not that that wouldn't be spent on overtime, it's just this is another set of eyes on overtime and how we're scheduling employees and how those funds are being used. Um, I can, I will say this and I'll say it again while I'm blue in the face, if the employees work overtime, you must pay overtime, um, regardless of what the situation is. Outside agency funding, uh, based on conversations, uh, there's a $100,000 in the budget currently for CDB. There's no other uh, non-mandated outside agency funding is included. So this is the only non-mandated outside agency funding. And I know that there are some um, discussions in regards how to allocate that $100,000 for CVB. Jail overcrowding. Um, <coughs> these charts here will show you where the break even point is for the city jail. Um, on the left is the local jail option. On the right is regional jail option. At 225 inmates today, the sheriff's budget is $5.1 million. And out of that 5.1, 900,000 is to get dedicated to inmate housing at other localities. If the jail population decreases to 145 inmates, you could roughly say that the budget would be 4.2 million because you could take out 900,000 from that budget. If the inmate population decreased to 120 inmates, there would be some additional savings. Uh, Getting that down to an exact number would be, um, is, at this point it would be hard to say, but based on calculations I've done, I think their budget could go down to $3.8 million. Now, out of each of those, there's local funding. So for 225 inmates, $2.56 million is from a locality. 145 inmates is $1.66 million, and local funding would stay the same um, at 1.66 million for 120 inmates as well. If you go to the regional jail, you can see 225 inmates, the local funding is 3.6 million, which is roughly $1.1 million more than 225 inmates at the local jail option. 145 inmates with local funding would be $2.5 million, which is still um, almost as great as having 225 inmates in our city jail. And 120 inmates, local funding is $1.6 million, which is what it would cost to sustain the local jail with 145 or 120 inmates. Below 120 inmates is where I think the city would have to start looking at going to the regional jail option where the city would actually be safe with money. Our trash collection rates have a proposed budget with a $4 increase in residential trash collection rates. Um, we'll have to do an ordinance amendment and we'll do that uh, 
maybe do it on the May 22nd and the June 8th meeting in order to have that effect on July 1. <coughs> Here are the options available to council at this point based on conversations I've had. Uh, we can reduce the overtime budget by approximately 50% add that to the contingency fund. Additional increase to the collection fee that's on top of the $4 collection fee that I've already proposed. Reallocate some CDB funds and also include in our budget, um, maybe not necessarily a line item, I know that's been mentioned, but set aside funds for auxiliary police and a volunteer fire staff allocation. Uh, those funds would probably be under your training and supplies under each one of those departments. So with that being said, at this point, we've got a first reading of the budget ordinance set for May 22nd and the second reading on Tuesday, June the 12th, barring any unforeseen circumstances. All right, so let's, uh, let's start at the revenue side. Just uh, a couple comments. If you, you said that the, on the revenue side that you feel where the revenue budget line is we're good, you don't feel like we can go up um, without adding a lot more risk to the budget. Um, do you see any downside risk? Well, there's always a potential for downside risk. Your real estate taxes are going to be pretty pretty steady. I mean, if you own real estate, if you own real estate in the city, you're going to pay the real estate taxes for the most part. There is a line item in our budget for delinquent taxes because we always estimate for delinquent taxes. Um, so that's taken into account. I think where your downside can potentially be is going to be on your other local taxes, which is going to be your local sales and use tax, uh, business license tax, Tax at lodging tax and restaurant mills tax. I think that's where you're um, most volatile simply because we can't control who's coming and staying into the city and buying mills in the city and purchasing goods in the city. Um, that's what gets to your most volatile. Based on what I've seen and what I know, I would anticipate the potential for local sales tax increase. And when we have a new business coming online at the fall, I think they're scheduled to be open sometime in September. Uh, so that would increase some local sales tax. We also have some <coughs> restaurants that are coming online later in the fall. Uh, that has already been included in this budget. So in regards to changing some of those most volatile ones, it would be a very, uh, I don't think it would be a prudent move to say that we could increase so significantly. Let me ask, I mean, because that was a question I had asked when we met. Some of these were both the real estate and concerning developments, we know they're coming. And, you know, you mentioned the one at the falls. You know, I think both in terms of sales and real estate tax, you know, that the timing of that, it, it looks, I like told by yesterday, it looks like they will be open before the end of the year. You know, it would anticipate they say much before that so you know to me why both in terms of real estate and sales i think to incorporate something there you know we know that we'll be open and something will happen if i'm not mistaken um my initial probably the march 15th to march 17th um, i had uh, put in the real estate taxes $12 million. Uh, after we went back and looked at it, we added an additional 150000 I think part of that includes the Hobby Lobby, if I'm not mistaken. Is that it? It's not. It's yeah. the, the, um, some of the other things I mentioned were, but I think that one. Yeah. And so, based on if you're going on what the building would be worth, I think there's a potential that you could add roughly $65,000 <coughs> to ourselves for our real estate tax just for half the year for this building. 65? I think 65 is that number. Uh, <coughs> I noticed on the uh, phase one of our DRI project. Do what, Mr. I'll say the Cabello's low was that phase one part of our project at the falls. I noticed you projecting a million dollar sales tax revenue in the DRI phase one. That's, uh, It's 24010-0500 sales tax DRI. Million dollar. 
<coughs> Do we know what effect that will have? That's on page 13 of the finance statement. Worksheets that you prepared earlier. <coughs> That's the state sales tax. Yeah, the 1% I'm presuming you're right. Talking. Uh, what happens if Cabela's leaves? Is that kind of what kind of impact is that going to have that number? And what then in return, what is that impact going to have from the revenue bond people? Well, it'll be a tremendous <coughs> impact that we have to prepare for. I think what we would prepare for for this upcoming fiscal year, uh, based on the current contract that's in place, I think they would have to stay in business until no later than the end of October. Um, and this whole just month. common sense, I'm thinking that they would stay open at least through the holiday period to uh, get the holiday sales. But after that, I think we'd have six months of lost revenue. I really can't <coughs> say what that would be specifically, <coughs> simply because um, the code does the code doesn't allow me to talk about that publicly. Right. Well, I'm just saying that that's a potential bomb to the revenue side picture. Correct. That's not nearly as firm as most of our other <coughs> Correct. Okay. Yeah, that's why that was actually the thing I had circled and we've talked about it a couple times is if there's any risk in here, it's that DRI phase one and, and phase two and three. So I would just say the message I have sent the city manager is is opposite of what Mr. Hartley said is we cannot count on tax revenues until they actually happen. <coughs> project delays can happen, so you never count on revenues until you actually have them flowing in. But on the downside of this, we have these flowing in, and we know there is potential risk there. So if anything, there's an argument to say we should pull the top line down a little bit to be more aggressive <coughs> on the downside risk than the neutral risk. Um, and so that's what I wanted to open up for the council to think about, because if you look at that million dollars Mr. Hubbard's talking about, and if things go the way he's describing, that million could be down by four hundred thousand, roughly. Uh, so you you've got a you got a really big number in there. I want to call the council. So, in regards to specific numbers, when we're talking about this, we have to be careful about the specific. I understand numbers. that, but we have to talk about the budget. So we've got a million dollars there. That's a risk, right? <coughs> that DRI phase one and two is a risk, right? So right. what we put on that line item to budget the rest of the cost around is important. And I'm not talking about specific companies. I'm talking about anybody up there. That's that's a development that's in process. It can go either way, right? And just like the other communities around exit seven, the other businesses, we've seen them kind of go because of what's going on in that market. So anything we're getting in the in the revenue side from that kind of private market movement is risky, right? And so we got to be really sure that we feel good about the safety of that number um, because the only thing we can control is the real estate tax, the property tax, and those things. So we have that in our control, but those other things aren't in our control. So we've got to be more conservative on those items. So I throw that out not to say we should come down or not. I'm just saying if there's risk on the revenue, those are the kind of things council needs to understand. What do you want to budget on the revenue line? Do you want to leave it where it's at? Because if we start adding money back on the cost line, I'm going to bring everybody back to that line item. Because if that goes down and we miss it, then you just multiply the effect of any kind of cost that we put back in the... Well, with that being said, I do want council to know I do have contingency plans in place not only for this coming year, but for next year as well, if there is a significant decrease up there. Those contingency plans include um, a, um, the funds not being available for a new fire truck and also for vacancies, vacancies that we have in the city will cover those costs for fiscal year 18-19. Um, if, if that event does happen for 19-20, we would have to eliminate the complete deficit at the landfill of $567,000 and we would potentially have to be looking at cutting uh, no less than 10 positions within the city or a five cent real estate tax increase 
or a combination of all three? Well, the more reason, Mr. City Manager, to go ahead and implement now a two cent per hundred tax increase because if that catastrophe happens, then what you're going to be doing is throwing on the people all at once five cents per hundred. If we do the two, per, two cents per hundred, we can maybe help with some things we need to help with now. And we can always take it back, perhaps after one year, if things are going well. But, you know, to tell people there's a contingency out here and it's going to be five cents a hundred on top of a four dollar waste collection fee. And that would only be a piece of it, Mr. Plain. Oh, I understand there's four components. So if right. you don't want to cut ten people under that contingency, then you're talking what we basically have talked about forever, ten percent, ten cents, twelve cents, or four more dollars on collection and some combination of <coughs> I mean that's where we're potentially at and probably realistically going to be in January 1 of 2019. And um, <coughs> so we can either take a little take a little bit of it now, now, or dump a lot on people. I mean I've heard up here over and over we don't want to be a town. Well guess what? If we don't start funding things and hoping that the magic some magic happens, then we're really asking for for it. And you talk about people leaving in droves. If you do it one time at five cents a hundred, you can't you can't stop people from leaving because they can't afford the taxes. But if we do two cents now, we can afford that, and we can do the school, and we can help out our public employees a little bit. I'm not saying raise their pay, but give them something. I mean, that is to me, it seems like you know we're short sighted here, and we're saying we don't we don't want to raise taxes anymore. I don't want to raise taxes anymore. That affects my family as much as it affects anyone else up here. Or anyone else out here that has real estate. But, you know, when do we realize that it's better to be cautious and prudent rather than conservative and foolish? And I've been conservative and foolish all my life, I guess, when it comes to money, but I, this is something we can't help if we really want to keep the city. We can't help it. And we know that that contingency is going to have to come into play, and it's probably going to have to come into play before we finish out this fiscal year that we're dealing with now. That's something to think about. Well, you can't do a property tax increase mid-year because it won't, won't get any money. That's right. That's right. So that's off the table as far as a contingency to cover this year's projection. Which is not included in this year's projection. Right, right. So, uh, well, I'm not going to argue the point. You would, would you like the capital project can suffer if the BRI suffers. That's a that's not going to kill operations right away. Uh, do you currently have unfunded positions in the budget in the police and fire? Uh, in the police department, I have one unfunded position in fire. There are four un unfunded positions at this or four funded positions that are unfilled. One funded right. position in police is unfilled. Um, when you do the numbers based on overtime, it appears that the fire department needs to hire two additional firefighters in order to bring their overtime numbers back into line with historical numbers that they've had in the past. Well, realistically, too, Mr. Mr. Eads, remembering the budget, and obviously you're not going to fill two roles. Uh, but <coughs> you're not going to be filling two roles. Um, the city attorney was budgeted, I think, at 150000 and realistically, we could potentially do contract out labor for that at half of that. So there would be potentially a savings of $75,000 there. And, uh, I mean, you know, Some I know. Some people all might not be doing either position. Who knows? <laughs> well, well. He's right, though. I had that on my note list, too. That's, that's one thing we talked about for sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean. Well, let's get back to real estate tax. I mean, everybody, everybody's got the book or access to the book. so. You know, on page 72 is the history of the real estate tax history, right? So a couple things I want to comment on here. From 2010, okay, to 2014, you notice how the city council tried to make themselves look good and lower the real estate tax rate? Right? So a hundred a dollar five a hundred is what our tax rate was in 2009. And then it dropped down to 94 cents. 
State of 94, 94, 99, 101. When you look at this city, we're we should be around a dollar five dollar seven for our size mm -hmm. if, you, if you look at the state of Virginia and all the city. So that decision by that council cost this city four million dollars of revenue. Four million in that time period. From 2010 <coughs> to 2014. It went from dollar five, stayed down at ninety-four, stayed there, went up to ninety-nine dollar one. Now since then it's we've had to take it up to increase the real estate reserve fund or the reserve fund, so now it's at dollar seventeen, right? So you can't do that. That's why communities gotta get involved, right? That's just politicians trying to make themselves look good. There was no there was no argument for that, right? Now we were at $1.19, right? The other thing to point out here, we were at $1.19 in 2017, and we know we had the reappraisals on real estate, right? So we adjusted them by two cents. So we did talk about a little bit of leaving that $1.19 alone and putting that extra amount into the reserve fund. But we, no, we talked about it. Oh, yeah. Good to do it. We didn't, we didn't do anything there. We, we could have passed you know, a budget and said we're going to increase our reserve fund funding, right? Um, the state laws is after an appraisal, you, your revenues cannot go up with a certain percent. Oh, well, yeah. yeah. Before, before the assessment was done, right? Okay. Then we established a restricted fund. Yeah, right? you got it. Okay. But we did. Thank so you so we much. were $1.19. So I'm just pointing that out because now it's dollar <coughs> seventeen. So the city has seen a dollar nineteen per hundred, you know, in the last twenty four months. I mean, we've been there, right? So. <coughs> I just point that out so that everybody understands that's what the two cents means. And know. also during that time period, I'd like to remind everyone, we were facing a recession within the country, which meant other revenues were on the decline as well because people weren't out spending money. So now you've had a double whammy with your local taxes being reduced simply because people weren't spending money. Plus you've had a revenue drop off, uh, drop due to the fact that real estate tax would be free. So Right. Now it was also the council that got us involved in that DRI project also, so $4 million is really light compared to what kind of burden that 2010-2014 put on the city, that we're having to figure out ways to keep it going, and um, you know, uh, so if you, so what you're saying, if we, if we raise it up, Mr. Mayor, uh, Mr. City Manager, two cents, we could take it to a dollar twenty-one. is that right? Dollar nineteen. We're at dollar seven. Which again is still high for a community this size. We should be around a dollar seven. You know, if this if this city was managed properly and had been managed for years, we'd be around a dollar five or dollar seven. That's where we should be. Without the falls, we definitely without all we'll this there. stuff, without we'll the solid waste landfill, without the falls, without all this stuff we've done to our city, mm -hmm. we should be around a dollar five to dollar seven. <coughs> You know, and the sad thing too, though, Mr. Mayor, is we've, we've talked about this how many times in the last couple of years we've brought this up that we've been killed by former councils. And it's the truth, but you can't get people to understand it. In a lot of ways, this last election showed they want to go back to those days. Let's go back to spend and spend and spend. So, you know, we'll see if they want to go back to the same group of people that got us in the. Well. Well, let's cut to the chase. We got we got to tell the city manager something on the revenue side. So, what's the appetite of city council? Are you, are you are, well, is this council ready to go up in real estate taxes? Is that what I'm hearing? Or you want to go up in solid waste funding? Or you want to leave it alone? We just we just saw that we're going up in solid waste funding, yes. right? Which we could go up more there. We decided that that was a reasonable jump. That we do need to go up there because that thing is losing money. We're having to fund it through the general account. But um, what's what's the appetite of council? Well, Can you hear it? What is the purpose of the two cents again? What are we going to do with the money? It's only two hundred thousand dollars. It's not going to address anything we've talked about. Yeah. So it's got to be put aside for emergency. Well, the one thing that concerns me, uh, we were talking about the jail studies that we had up here, and Mr. City Manager, and what I haven't heard yet from anyone. Now I know they're going to address this in a moment, but you've shown it on the on the expenditure side of your slides. How much is the cost to modernize and fix? We well, haven't heard that cost either. I mean, before I, we get in the cost, let's stay focused on the revenue. So, just, I need to know the cost before I make a decision. I'm going to come back to that. Okay. So, if, if, if council has no appetite to raise real estate taxes at all under no circumstances, and then, then we can just line through it and not come back to it. 
But if, if you've got an appetite to go up by a couple cents, it means $200,000. And we can come back and talk about it, what, what we do with the money, right, once we go through the expense side. Well, let me tell you what, I, 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 have, I said it earlier, I have an appetite for it. And when you say that, I mean, look, realistically, we can cut the city attorneys from 150 to 75, maybe even down to 60, 5,000 per month. Okay? <coughs> then what we do is we raise two cents. Then we can come back in on the potential for the school. They can escrow those funds and potentially get started on a new school. And probably if we cut through this budget enough, you know, we realistically we can probably find some sort of bonus payment for our public employees. Now I'm not saying raising their that we can't afford to raise a percent a percent because we have to pay benefits on top of that. So it actually is more than what it appears to be. But a, a bonus to them or something along those lines would be appropriate. So yeah, I'm prepared as a citizen of this city and as a councilman to say two cents. And that may not be enough, but I'm prepared to say two cents. Nowhere near. Nowhere. No, I know that. But at least, at least it takes some pain out of perhaps next year or something. Well, I mean, if you're talking about doing the raises next year and not this year, I'm, I'm talking about I say this year the 17. One, one I'm talking about one time payment, Mr. Yeah. I, I don't think we can afford as a city to go Well, you still have to have the money for a one time payment. True. We true. don't have it. True. That's true. That's true. I get you. I, I would be more in favor of looking at the collection fee because to the, there's not a huge difference in one cent in tax and one dollar there. And, and the collection fee is solving another problem that, that we have with the landfill. It's, it's making it more sustainable, uh, you know, and, but. How much of a taste do you have for that, sir? <laughs> let me give you the number real quick. One dollar rate on the collection fee equates to roughly $80,000 over the course of the year. It's about 100. So, so if we went up four dollars more to eight. Well we already went up well, to eighteen, right? Yeah. Now. So you go up I think to eight dollars, another dollar, dollar or maybe two. Depending what we need and what well, tell us where we to go. So we laid the groundwork. We we were at fourteen, I think, is that right? Eighteen. We were at eight. We're at eighteen. We're at eighteen currently. We wouldn't get a four. We're going to go to twenty two based on all conversations I've had. So we're at eighteen we're going up four to twenty two. Based on Mr. Hartley's comments, right. maybe one to twenty three or twenty four. So that four dollars is about three hundred and three hundred and twenty nine thousand, yeah. I think. And because we so owe BBU you have to take ninety five percent because we owe BBU five percent for the collection fee because they take care of it on their side. Um, for the, the So two dollars more would give us roughly a hundred and sixty thousand. So 320 plus 29 plus 160. Correct. So about $500,000. Correct. Where did you, where, how'd you get to where, where that coming from? I thought he said four would be 329. Four's already, four's already in here. Okay, three, but you're adding so you four dollars. Four more. So, mm. That's what I'm saying. There's already four. So maybe increase on one or two, I think you might. We already went up on the collection fee already. We're still not good for what we need to get, maybe. No, but so the other two dollars gets us about one hundred sixty. Because I think that puts us in a better spot. I mean, it versus two cent on the real estate, as long as we're going to put the same I'm for it. revenue, mm -hmm. but I say as long as we're going to put that money in reserve and not spend it, I'm for it. If we're going to spend it, we're not getting any ground. <coughs> you can't do anything with one hundred sixty thousand dollars compared to what we've talked about. Well, we're just trying to come up with what we'll out there. Yeah. We'll come back and summarize it when we get to the... And, 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 remember, and remember, when we do a rate increase on the solid waste fund, that's going to the enterprise fund, so it really does not necessarily affect the general fund. It goes uh, backwards. It, it's back, exactly. It's less money we send that. That's right. Well, it's we've money. got to prepare for the bells to close. That, uh, that we've got to prepare for that contingency now. We've got to. Which contingency? Cabela's shutting the doors after oh, all those. Yeah, and I think this is the only place to put that. Let's, 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 let's keep it keep it as a general discussion. We're all <laughs> speculating. Speculation doesn't Well yeah, that doesn't count. count. <laughs> okay. We do it all the time. Well, we shouldn't. <laughs> I mean I do it on the street every day. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, okay. All right. okay, so we talked about real estate taxes, we talked about <laughs> collection fee, a couple of dollars. Uh, is there any other revenue items? 
property tax we said is... Uh, the question I have is the unassigned fund balances. Could we get a total of that from now? I know we split it up between the general fund, 1.1 million, some odd change, and then there's some in the landfill <coughs> reserve for bond payment. Yeah, then when you, you're talking about when you split up the... How much are we putting away to the side for bond payment purposes? She won't pull the exact number. I know we have projected 1.1 million unassigned fund in the general fund, and there's a fairly large number in the landfill for bond debt reserve. Okay, while she looks at that, we're going to take a five-minute break. All right, we're ready to get started. All right, so we'll move from revenues now, I think, into expenses. So, and we're already taking us through the expenses. We'll put the summary up again just real quick. So we got the summary of expenses up. Here's the expenditure changes this past year, or this coming year, I should say. Okay, so the uh, animal control has to go up because we have to have an animal shelter. We've talked about that, right? The products right. and supplies, is that is that a must-do this year? Which one? The chronos. Animal we have animals. liability issues if we do not do chronos. The uh, liability issues? That is, and the cost of the chronos is roughly, I'm going to say 30000 and our liability issues are uh, tenfold that by not having a proper timekeeping system in place. Supplies, the majority of the supplies there are for police vehicle, uh, police to be computers for the police. Um, and I even reduced it by half of what they wanted to purchase simply because we just can't purchase everything all at once. Um, I think Mr. Wingard's been out with the officers at least one time and their computers are uh, and they need significant upgrades. That said, please wait while we update your software 30 <laughs> minutes later. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I did get something on overtime in there. Where was the overtime slide? So here, um, these are all the departments that have a line item for overtime. Finance requested $500 in overtime. Um, I would reduce that to zero. Lake Four Board, two thousand dollars reduced again. Police Department, they have one hundred twenty-six thousand eight hundred. That does not include special events or grant overtime. I think we need to leave the special events alone. They have forty-two thousand budget for that and forty-two thousand dollars in uh, grant overtime. We need to leave those alone due to the fact that we do have two races every year. We have rhythm and roots uh, and special events such as that Christmas tree lighting. Um, Items such as that that we know we're going to spend. So there's 126800 that's allocated for other overtime, which would include, you know, officers covering for people on vacation or sick leave. Um, at this point, I've reduced that by half and will attempt to work on a better scheduling system. However, that those funds are going to have to be moved in contingency. I'm going to have to know that those funds are set aside for overtime. If they work the overtime, they've got to be paid the overtime. So this uh, overtime you're proposing, we take all the department overtime to zero, but that money gets scooted over into the C major contingency fund, and then it's on a high approval basis. I'm saying we take half of those funds and move it to contingency, simply because I know there's going to be overtime. You know, regardless of what we attempt to do, we know there's going to be overtime. The question is, what can we do to help reduce that overtime? And I think starting at a 50 percent reduction is the best. Um, if we can come, if Throughout this next fiscal year, if we can see that they have uh, met the goals of overtime based on this 50% reduction, we know we're on the right path. What else can we do to improve scheduling, improve other things, so that we do not have to uh, pay out in overtime as much as we have? So you can see right now we have $251,400 budgeted in the overtime that can be adjusted, and I would adjust that by taking it down. Uh, to $130,000, which is $121,000, we need to go to the reserve fund or to a contingency fund. So, I mean, what 
what's the point of doing that? Type well, of this is just one of the options if we're looking at funding <coughs> the schools or um, this is how this is how you, you get fund the schools. You're not going to have any continuous. Right. So I mean, this is this is just one of the options. What was the question? Well, what are we going to do with this? And the so answer is the answer. One hundred twenty-one grand. The answer what is what difference does it make? If you're here's, the, here's the idea: you don't you don't you don't budget or plan for overtime. You manage overtime. Right. right. You do what you have to do. So the way you manage it, the guy who has to make that decision, you take what overtime you think you might have because you can't predict it. And you put it over in the city, city manager's fund so that it just doesn't get spent arbitrarily. That's good. That's what that's what the I whole understood is. that in case we wanted to fund the school. Well, this is just okay. one piece. Of, this is just one piece, depending on all the different options that we have. When you start moving this money, well, this isn't a piece at all. It's you got to. But I said from the beginning, this goes into the contingency fund. All right, yours. Right. right. Yeah. So he can decide if they're. Yeah, I've got no problem with that. But yeah. then they threw in if you want to yeah, fund the school. Fine. Here's some money. No, it's not money. Yeah, to do. Well, what he's saying, there might be money there, and if it's managed aggressively, you might find that there is a hundred thousand dollars at the end of the year. Yeah, that does get spent. It depends on how you run, which will be used next year. If this discuss the contingency. Well, it depends on the run rate. It depends on. Yeah. Then you may wake up having well, we eighty thousand dollars less in overtime you spent. We also mandated that they patrol the interstate within the city limits, and that. According to the chief, at the time that we asked them to do that, was going to require overtime in order to do that because that's basically outside the city limits, so to speak. So the normal, I should say, the normal routines of. If you uh, go back to the revenues, I have adjusted the revenues based on what I've seen on actuals. It is on page nine. Count fourteen thousand five hundred four fishers. <laughs> you can see that last year there was it was budgeted one hundred sixty-two thousand in other fines. That's one four zero one zero 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 three. Yeah, that has been reallocated back up to court fines because, as far as the court's concerned, they don't care how it was how those fines were received it's simply a fine in their book and then they send it to us so there's internal controls now in place to see exactly how effective that has been so i've reduced that amount roughly a little over half and we're only including two hundred thousand dollars in our budget uh, for fines altogether for this upcoming year so we did reduce that um i would well, hope that, that will reduce your overtime right but you know, you're still expecting seventy thousand dollars, basically, from you know, policing and radaring that we're also expecting. So there will be overtime for that. It's just, it's we haven't set aside as much for it. <coughs> well, it, it seems to me if, if this is just going in contingency, it's more of an administrative thing. It's not. Oh, yeah, so I'm not sure. I just yeah, want to make sure that we're all that's clear that that's not mabel spend. That's yeah. just something that we hope we don't spend. I mean, it, it, but we got at the end of the year, year, you might end up with some extra funds. Or, or <coughs> as you go along, you might have something in case something pops up that you know where it's, you can take this on. But it's not solving some of the other issues. So, uh, Well, if you imagine it, if your fines are greater than the overtime you're paying, then you're going to come up with And I guess one of my questions is with the where you have vacancies in police and fire, you know, in, in the overtime we have now, if you actually staff those up, then does that, will that help reduce the overtime? In, regard, in regards to police, probably not, because they were only frozen two positions this year. Uh, I've eliminated one of those positions. Their overtime is, um, it would be, it need to be significantly more than just one person added back in order to uh, eliminate any overtime. Well, the real problem that I see in the police department is that the family leave and off for training and this, that, and the other. So even though the number we have is really not a full contingency on the job at any given time because they're off for legal reasons. If, if officers get hurt, uh, have to have surgery, and I've got one officer right now that's gonna have to have surgery here in the near future, he'll be out an extended period of time for that. 
Uh, they just say if one of them has a new, newborn child, they have the opportunity to take off for that. So there are, you know, there are things that we have to cover for. Oh, we've had them this year. Right. So, I mean, there's no reason to think they're not going to happen again. Exactly. In the coming year. Well, I mean, you've got the money in the budget for it. If you don't have to spend it, you don't have to. But as far as pulling it out for contingency, that's fine. If you want to do it, bookkeeping-wise, it doesn't matter. Even if you put in $250,000 for expense and you want to spend a hundred, you still end up with 150 surplus, whether you have it in your contingency or in the, the budget. <coughs> So either way you want to do it, that's just fine. So let's talk about the city attorney, hundred and fifty thousand. Got a recommendation to pull it down to seventy five. So that's uh, on page uh, seventeen, I think. I think we can actually pull it down to sixty, realistically, five thousand a month and probably need to keep maybe a fifteen thousand cushion out there though, just in case there's some some project that he needed to do over that to cut it down. I would feel more comfortable with 75 with that. Okay. Okay. Um, I said 19. Page 17. 17. And I mean, I, I can see where you, I can see that. Okay. 75. So I got 75 right now, so you feel like you can do that. Any discussion on the city attorney from 150 to 75? Uh, I'm afraid that that's enough. Well, they're either going to take it at 75, but they're not going to. Well, but they can handle it. Mitchell? What have we incurred this year uh, to date on any kind of legal stuff um, that's outside of? I mean, this amended budget says 150. Are we actually going to spend that? You'll spend it simply because that's how I'm getting paid. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We but have to thank the city attorney. In this budget, you're up in the city manager. In the 1819 budget, yeah. in but for this fiscal year. My point is, what what's specific what's been legal been outside <laughs> legal stuff that we spend? significant outside legal at the moment off the top of my head I can think of roughly um, we've got the issue with the eminent domain case and then there's another issue that um, legal matter another legal matter so right now right now since July 1 of 17 to this point we will probably spend Ten thousand dollars on outside legal stuff that I have not been able to handle myself. We've already had that statement to pass on by you becoming the attorney, and we, we changed city managers, and you basically took both positions, and we had to pay off the other city manager half a year because of the contract. So we still saved in this fiscal year half of her salary plus benefits. Is that fair? That's correct. All right. All right, so we spent 10 this year. You're, you feel good about 75 versus 150 then? No as, as long as we didn't get any any outside protracted type legal issue, but okay. I don't know. If it's in contingency. If it's in, if it's in my contingency fund, then we've got it if we need it. Okay. Okay. Next so that's what we want to do, push, push it over into contingency with 75 k okay. I think so. Um, I, I mean, I don't want to be the only one talking here, but uh, city treasurer, I'm looking at this one. Again, my mind goes back to 1617 actuals, which was $339,000, and now it's uh, budgeted at three eighty five. dollars I think that's $45,000 that we can talk about. Mm -hmm. um, what page? Page 19. Page 1819. Page 1819. Page 19, that near the top, has got the total for that department. So you can see in actuals in 16, 17 years, 339, 409. And now the budget recommendation is 385, 704. They actually asked for a lot more than that, but uh, Randy's pulled them back. So I'm saying if they operated and did the job that we need done in 16, 17, why can't they still do it at near that number? If, if I'm not mistaken, that was a year where she was down at least one person that entire year. There was quite a bit of turnover, and that has stabilized. <coughs> so um, if she had been fully staffed, probably the 385 is a more accurate number. 
the amended budget, I mean, that's what you think the year's going to end up this year, 385? Somewhere in that range? The amendment's 373 or 17, I think. And I think 1819 with, with the VRS increase, I think it will be close and a tax sale increase. Um, based on actuals, yes, I think the 1819 To me, the, when I look at that, I mean, it's personnel and benefits of big thing driving that. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know. And then the other thing that jumps out to me is the DMV stock fees. Uh, but I would assume there's offsetting revenue. Yes, we're making money off of that. Yeah, so, yeah, so that's that's actually a good thing. Well, salaries and wages is 158.5, and then it jumped all the way up to 200. So that's yes. a staffing change she's talking about. And then the other one that I see that's significant, the DMV stock fees, but to me that that's a good thing if we're paying that because there's way more offsetting revenue. Yes. Refresh my mind, is this what the city of Bristol, Virginia is actually paying toward our constitutional officers or is this an aggregate of what we're receiving from the state plus the total outflow of expenditures further back on this planner in the actual um, department statements we show the local net funding okay so this isn't necessarily this is just the aggregate here the total right. total expenditures can you tell how much we actually as a city pay two hundred fifty two thousand eight hundred four. how much two fifty two eight hundred four is what's budgeted it's on page 99. that's what i thought we were looking at we were we were back at the front no, we're looking at combined hours and state. Yeah. Yeah. So net local funding in 16, 17 year actual is 220. And this budget is saying it's going up to 252. That's a richer big one position. Can you show me it's where the Commonwealth Attorney's Office is then? And what yes. we paid the Commonwealth Attorney. Right. Who is there? I want to, I'm asking her to go ahead and pull it. Okay, it's, on, it's past that. It's, uh, it's in the 2000s. That's what we actually pay the four hundred and fifty-three thousand eight hundred and fifty-two dollars. Is that? Are you looking at Treasurer Commonwealth Turner? I'm looking at Commonwealth Turner right now. Uh, bottom of the page two ten actual sixteen seventeen was one ninety two two eighty six. Budget at seventeen eighteen two ten one forty seven. Budget at eighteen nineteen two twenty three. So why we've gone up on that? Uh, your increases on your fringe benefits, which increased um, roughly ten percent, which a lot of that's due to that retirement adjustment that everybody gets hit with every year. When they do a lousy job of investing the money, they got to make it up from all the city. <laughs> so we had no call or no say whenever they decided <coughs> to position, you know, Bristol's town less than seventeen, city less than seventeen thousand. And we had no say so when they hired a new assistant victim witness coordinator for the city, do we? According to the comp number, um, well, all that victim witness, from my understanding, that's all flow through that new uh, victim witness coordinator, so it's no impact on our budget. No impact. No impact. I looked into that back in probably March. And doesn't the state mandate as to how many employees each of those that's departments correct. may have, and if they go over like we have with the sheriff's department? Well, if we go over that state allowed, then we pay the full vote. That's right. Salary and fringe. The comp board has a. If they stay within the state guidelines, all we pay for is the fringe. It's amazing to me that how much our commonwealth attorney costs and how many attorneys and so forth we have staff here compared to Smith County, which has twice, three times the population maybe in the county. And, uh, <coughs> and we're so. We have four attorneys here just like Smith County has. And I just think that, that is. Uh, it's, 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 it's questionable, especially when you go down and see people that are standing sitting around in the courts. Uh, you yeah, know, I mean, that's. So that's what makes up that 453 salary wages, is about four attorneys? Well, no, that's uh, seven total. You got four seven. attorneys and uh, three staff members. Yeah, you got the, uh, you know, three, three secretaries. Uh, you got the expense of paying for a rental building that no other Commonwealth attorney in Southwest Virginia does. They're all part and parcel of living inside the courthouses or city halls and so forth, but no, not Bristol. Bristol's special. 
at least as far as Commonwealth Attorney's Office, and we paid twenty-seven thousand. So it shows here for lease rental of that building. And I'm, I don't know if the state's picking up any of the tab on that too or not, but it shows twenty-seven thousand going to this building. It used to be the old Tasty Grill down here on. Um, you know, they don't advertise that's where the, the Commonwealth Attorney's Office is, but you know that's where the Commonwealth Attorney's Office is. And uh, they didn't have a paid parking lot. And they get that kind of money. Uh, you know, I think that uh, we ought to look into, and seriously look into, unless there's a lease that prohibits us, looking into moving that inside of the city halls and so forth and so on, because that money can very much well be spent better helping some of our employees and so forth and so on, as opposed to uh, paying someone for a rental of a building. And uh, I think we can make room. Even if they're not all at the same place, they don't have to be. There's fun, something called phones, still have those, and so forth. So, yeah. I've done uh, research this past week on that very issue, and uh, due to some legal issues, I'll reserve that for another time to give you an update on that, please. Okay. Right. We'll still have to get into the Sheriff's Department here since they're here. Huh? Yeah, I said it's probably worth looking into. I mean, yeah, I don't know right. where, I wrote that where the space is. Or what the issues are, but yeah, that's a good point. I mean, there's obviously a lease contract in place, but but you're right. I mean, if you got room here that they could be versus leasing another building, that makes sense financially. So, and in particular, if we don't get if the annex doesn't work out, for instance, uh, you know, with the with the potential with the jail having an additional the place, department. right? The old police department be ideal for that. So, um, I think so get that black mold going. Yeah, baby. Wouldn't hurt my feelings at all. <laughs> <laughs> Defense attorney. <laughs> yeah. Just go ahead and uh, I'll put that back over to the city attorney because that's the case. <laughs> well, since we got the sheriff's department here to, to work yeah. with us, let's, let's do the sheriff's budget. Uh, talk about that. That's reasonable. I'm, I'm sure Mr. Hutton will. The Huttons will stay though afterwards, won't you just list all the stuff? You need Tell us about it, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, which page is it? 123 uh, and 124. <laughs> coming year, um, 300,000 of that 900,000 is basically going to be set aside for alternative sentencing program. Uh, I will say we do have a policy in now in place. Uh, I would love and I think everybody on our staff would love to take credit for the policy. It's a, probably about a 20 page policy, but uh, Alice and Judge Johnson's secretary worked very diligently the past uh, two weeks to get that policy in place um, so that we can have something to go by. That was presented to us on Thursday, Thursday afternoon, I think. Thursday, yeah. So here's the proposal. We just have it as a program proposal right now. Uh, with that being said, I have to give hats off to the Sheriff's Department. When we started this discussion back in uh, probably February or March, we had roughly 240 inmates uh, in custody of the Bristol Virginia Sheriff's Office. So we had roughly 80 to not many, close to 90, close to 90. 90 inmates in outside jurisdictions. Our Sheriff's Department has worked tirelessly looking to make sure that individuals who need to be in DOC custody are getting into DOC custody and they are doing everything within their power to get inmates back within the city jail. So since that time, they've reduced the number of inmates down by roughly half. So at wow. the moment, we've got 40 to 42 inmates out. <laughs> Yeah. Big deal, man. So, what, I mean, what did you bust them do? 
don't tell. Those guys. <laughs> they were, they were 240, so they, they had a capacity of 150. I'm going to keep my numbers. <laughs> so that was 90 we were sending out. So they right. worked it down to uh, about 45 or 40 now. Right. right. So it's half what it was. Right. And that, that number, um, I ran it the other day, that number is three or $400,000. Oh, it's significant. It's a significant number that they have done. Which could pay us for this program we're trying to get Right, here. and in regards to the program, there is a cost component yeah. to the program, so there's going to be revenue generated from the inmates who take part in this program, so that'll help offset the cost of this program. Basically, what this program is doing is taking the place of drug court. And um, it's not only is it taking the place of drug court, this will, in my heart of hearts, I hope, will help decrease the poverty rate in the city of Bristol. Simply because when you've got 200 inmates sitting in jail over there, I would say the vast majority of those folks live in poverty. And if I've met with a large local business this past week, they are on board for hiring uh, people that are in this program. So at the moment they have eight vacancies that they just cannot fill. If they fill a vacancy, something else happens where they have to let someone go. And most of us do the drug use. Uh, they cannot find, I think you'll find in the manufacturing world, the manufacturing uh, world cannot find individuals who can pass drug tests. So this local business is extremely excited about having this program in place because these individuals are going to be drug tested. And they're going to be drug tested a lot. And that way, if they're going to work, they know that they're going to be clean. So they're, they're very excited about this opportunity and we'll give the people an opportunity to work. I think that's going to be the difference in this program and what you see in other programs across the state. Other programs across the state have yet to materialize putting an inmate convicted felon with a real job. It's usually community service-like jobs. Here we are actually we're, we're bridging that gap that does not exist. So once we get that uh, bridge in place, uh, I think we'll see a significant difference in uh, recidivism rates and people actually making a difference in their own life and their family's life. Well, that, that's a huge difference for a handout. Instead of getting people back on their feet and then setting them outside the door of your business and then you're on your own again, well, they get right back in this way. You put them into a job that right. says, hey, I'm going to well, stay here. And they need to get their, and we, I hope there's part of a component to help individuals figure out a way to get their driver's license back too, because that's a big hindrance right. and so forth and so on. If with people too that are getting out of the facility or whatever, they don't have a driver's license. They're driving on suspension because they haven't been able to pay fines and costs. I don't know. Call again. That's right, and it's, it's, it's continual pain. But but it, as far as this program is concerned, and I I talked to someone yesterday about this. Uh, in my understanding, the cutoff is going to be a sentence of eighteen months and less. Is that correct? First I think that's, that's how we're looking at it right now. Um, I think you and I both know that some of these typical drug crimes that we see your guideline range is probably less than 18 months on some of them unless, it's it's on, it, yeah, unless you know they're a multiple offender or something of that nature mr East, let me ask you and i did have a conversation with somebody that, that very much in a note with the test of more he's going to maybe be the person to implement some of this stuff so he said that uh first time he, he doesn't feel like this distributors should be in this or whatever, but I said, well, on a case-by-case -case basis, if your first-time drug offense, you know, selling a pill or two to someone, and they have no other criminal record, certainly no violence or whatever, that we need to look into that because you're really talking about a lot of our people down here are first-time drug offenders who basically sold a pill to buy some food or buy sold a pill to get pills, you know, for themselves. I mean, it's, it's a it, we we can't just narrow it down to just thieves or you know, we have to, we have to, we're not just users even, you know. We I mean, if you're caught with whatever, two, three, four, you're considered a dealer, right? Well, you know, and that's you kind of stupid. <laughs> that's kind of stupid. I mean, I think, I mean, I'm not what you asked me, but I mean, I think that logic is failed and flawed. I think if, if I you're caught with five pounds of coke, for instance, I think you're a dealer. Let me kind of bring us back to the program proposal. At least I have not heard anyone say people convicted of a distribution crime would not be available to this program. I, I have not heard that, and we've sat in this room together for numerous hours over the past couple of months. No one that I've heard, now that may be someone that they're not saying it, but I have not heard that, and I would be very disheartened if that was the case, simply because 
as you say, a lot of the individuals see, we see on the drug crimes are one and two, three pill buys that truly are not what I would consider, and I don't think most people would consider a dealer. Um, That's not a business. <laughs> no, no, five pounds of coke or five, you know, five pounds of marijuana so, is not for personal use. Let's get it. If you get right. caught out here from trucks so or something. I, so. You know, in my opinion, and I think it, not, not just drug crime, but any crime is on the table as long as it's not a sex crime or a violent crime. Good. Uh, if, Good. if we can see that someone has the ability to do something different other than sit in jail, it, it's my opinion, and I, I think Captain will back me up, that just about anybody's going to be eligible for this program. So this goes beyond just drug use. This goes beyond drug. I mean, because the major, more, if you're sitting in there on a theft charge, it's simply probably because of drugs. drug use. You just didn't have, have drugs on you when you got caught that day. That's right, Mr. Reed. Let me ask you two. Let me say a couple things before we get to on the track here. That this this is a big news item. This is a big deal here. So I was really impressed yesterday with when we were down here with the meetings that's going on between Commonwealth Attorney, the Sheriff's Department, yourself, the right people in the room. And so this is an example of how you solve a problem. So it's going in the right direction. Now we're not there, but it's going in the right direction, right? So we got we can't count our chickens before they hatch, right? But I think everybody now understands around the table the significant issue we've got facing us with this inmate housing, right? So this community is trying to be the leader to come up with a program that's completely different than anybody's ever tried before. We're trying to get these folks back to work, right? And so we've had a private industry in the community to step up and say, hey, I'm willing to do that. In fact, I have about eight or ten employees that I can't feel because I can't find people who are drug free. Well, these folks happen to be already tested and ready to go to work. So we reached out and we reached out to the other manufacturers Friday with an email and we're going to propose to them the same thing. So the Sheriff's Department's predicting that of the population that we're sending out, there's, there's a significant number in there that we can put back to work. So it does two things. It gets our costs down, right? gets them back to work, gets them back in society. So this is a big deal. This could this could mean a half a million to six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars the other way from where we were, right? Because we were still putting out five hundred thousand even two or three years ago when it had ballooned about nine hundred. So so they've got it down now to about you know six or seven hundred. So it, it it's moving the way we need to. So this could really change the landscape of our financial um, Picture, obligations, you know, yeah. our obligations going out the door for this inmate housing. <laughs> so let me just finish. So the other thing that was discussed, which is some out of box stuff, which is where else can we utilize current city assets, right? Current buildings and facilities to help facilitate this program, right? And so we came up with the with the annex, right? Now, Department of Corrections has looked at it. They thought we could use it, but then they come back with some changes that need to be made to make it suitable, like uh, the water fire extinguisher system, you know, the pit leaves and new codes and buildings and some, some things like that. But but that's not that's not a killer. That that's good that's good that we now are, are identifying a way to use a current asset to completely unload potentially all the inmates that we're sending out at a tremendous cost. So I think now we gotta kinda step up to the bar so to speak and say what what do we feel good about this budget year that we can pull down the sheriff's department budget, slide some of it over in contingency to have some monies there to help with the annex and what modifications we need to do and whatever else needs to be supported, right, in the program, like, uh, you know, the work that people have to have the little uh, trackers, you know, whatever. So, so those monies need to be available uh, in order to, for this thing to be successful. So some of it could be savings, right? Some of it we could pull down the budget to actually save the expense. Right. We've already got the inmate down quite a bit. Some of it needs to scoot over to have some money to be able to do that. So that's what I'm interested in hearing is how this council, you want to take that. Here's, here's what I would propose. Out of the 900,000, I'm not looking at the rest of the Sheriff's Department's budget because in regards to that, I don't think there's much else to change. But in regards to the 900,000, 300,000 needs to be set aside with the alternative sentencing program. Now, in regards to the annex, the sheriff has been very diligent about trying to get the DOC to get in to our jail, to look at our jail, to see exactly what the lifespan of our jail can be and things that we need to do to ensure that we do have some sort of lifespan with it. Um, I would estimate it's going to cost us $700,000. I don't want to get into the specifics, but just say $700,000 to come up 
with the current jail now to make it up to where we need it to be where the sheriff feels comfortable. I think um, $100,000 would need to be set aside for the annex in order to get it up to where it needs to be because as it stands right now, the OC came and looked at it. We could probably put 19 to 23 inmates in that annex. If we put 19 to 23 inmates in that annex, that brings us down another 19 to 23 inmates would be in, in the outside jurisdictions. So that's roughly $180,000 savings by bringing 20 people into the annex. Um, so we need to do some things to get that annex in compliance with DOC. And I think that would roughly cost us maybe $100,000, probably a little bit less, but I think $100,000 would be a fair number. So out of the $900,000 we have set aside right now, I would feel comfortable saying three hundred dollars needs to be set aside for the alternative sentencing program, and a hundred thousand needs to be set aside strictly for annex. Mr. Eads, let me I mean, it's something that hasn't been talked about. You you know you eliminated three parks and recreation employees on this year's budget. Well, my understanding, and tell me correct me if I'm wrong, individuals will be offered even if they don't have a job per se, they will be able to work for right. the city. our city. Yes. And so individuals that I'm really looking at probably coming for our city are going to be people on pretrial release. Those are people that have yet to be sentenced. Uh, they can come in, they can work for us. Uh, Weedy, Mo, whatever, whatever we need done, they can do. So when you see contract labor set aside for parks and rec or public works, there's going to be a component of that that's already going to be saved simply because we're going to have inmates ready to go to take care of some of those problems. And if that's the case and it works, it's going to be a, that's a, on top of savings that we haven't yet realized. And if if all this works according to plan, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, that always happens. Yeah, Bristol. You know, uh, Bristol has never made a plan that didn't come. This, out. this, this sounds is, good. Though. This is truly a financial game changer for the city. Oh, when yeah. you're looking at a savings of roughly six hundred thousand dollars a year. That's 25 percent of what we need to get to get to our debt service payment in 2022, and that's huge. Um, that we can set aside for debt service payment in the future. Is it even feasible? I mean, we may have someone as a sheet. We call it sheet rock. Sheet, no, not well, sheet rock, and also sheet the metal. sheet and air, the heat and air I mean, kind of people. There's plenty. I mean, there's you know, who knows what we have over there. I mean, probably speak but I mean we do have talented. You used to have a lot of good brick masons and you know people like talented that. Talented individuals. That we Very talented. Use. But uh, so now let me let me just say. You use those to fix the annex potentially. Let, I mean, let, me, let me get the lawyer side of it real quick. Okay. Before we move forward. Uh, assuming, no, assuming we still have 40 inmates outstanding that can't go anywhere else. Assume the alternative sentencing program fails. That's roughly $569,000 that is needed to cover inmate housing and outside jurisdictions. So that's the worst case scenario at 40 inmates. We know what the worst case scenario is at uh, uh, 90 inmates, that's close to a million dollars. But if we can keep things as they are right now, it's $569,000 that we have to come up with in order to cover inmate housing. That's the worst case scenario. I think we need a nice thank you letter to Allison in Judge Johnson's office from signed by the mayor and city manager appreciating her hard work because I was in there one day and she said that she was working on that and so forth and obviously she's done, she's done a heck of a job and I think just I know you verbally appreciate said your appreciations and everybody can but I think it'd be nice to have something like that. I'll take care of that. All right, so we'll, we'll come back to the numbers again. Yeah, this is all that budget. <laughs> right? So we had in the budget $900,000. Right. right. Which if you divide by $14,000 a person that's about 214 inmates that had to go out you know, minus 150, that's that's the expense to send them out, right? So they're now down to about 183, I think, was the take yesterday. So the difference between 214 and 183 is about $430,000, roughly, right? So you said you have to have about 300 put in contingency and about 100 for the NA, so that pretty much takes up that 434. So is that what you're saying? So let's slide that over. That's what I would recommend to counsel. All right, so then the challenge the Sheriff's Department is how, how far down from 183 can, do we think we can really go? You know, 165, 168, how many, how many more can we garner on the work release and, and so forth to get the cost coming down even further? Well, and I, I think, you know, I don't want to say anything that he wouldn't agree with, but um, it's not just the Sheriff. 
that's going to be making these decisions. I mean, a lot of it's the court system. The sheriff's just got to do what the court system says to do. And in my heart of hearts, I feel like we can truly get this number down. Uh, our goal is to have 45 people in this program. So if we have 45 people in this program, that means we have roughly 145 people in the jail. Uh, so that's the first year goal is to get 45 people in this program. I think we get more into that program as time goes. But so you think of the 183, there's about 45 people there that would qualify for the program. There's probably more that would qualify mm -hmm. for the program. Um, it, so I, I'm going to challenge the team to keep doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. We need every person that's qualified you know, yeah. to have a place. Well, that's my goal. I mean, you know, I want to get down to 120 in the jail. I mean, really what I'd like to get down is no one in the jail because that means we're doing something right as a community and we've got people jobs and doing exactly what they need to be and we're taking care of the opioid epidemic and we're doing everything that we should be doing as a community to help these individuals. Okay, because we're going to find a position for everyone that's about to tell them they're out there. Well, I've got so they're absolutely out there. So I'm not worried about finding a position. We've got to take the 183 you got today and see how far down you can pull it mm -hmm. with the qualified people we go put to work. We will right. find a place to work. So, but for this budget cycle, are we saying we want to kind of stop at this? Uh, so leave it as is. Leave it as is, is and scoop that money over and well, let the program develop. And here's, what I would, here's what I would suggest instead of putting that in contingency. I know what 400000 of that's for. We leave it in that line item. Uh, so basically, for that expense. It's for that expense. If you wanted to do anything, you would take 100000 out and you would put it over into um, city manager's maintenance of building and property for the sheriff's department. Uh, that way we can, that money's already budgeted for uh, fixing that annex. That's what I would suggest doing. And leave, that would leave you 800,000 and it may house it. What did you say you're predicting the annex? Just move it down to the maintenance. I'm gonna say 100,000. I mean, it could be a little more, could be less, but I think that would get us a good start. If that would get it functional, where department I think, I think, I would hope so. Do you think that's fair to say based on? Let's be more designed for minimum security, though. It's not designed for anyone that, I mean, really. Our trustees, we would move trustees over into the annex, and then we could bring other individuals back. And we need to find a team of people that can do that work to help save on 100,000. I'm sure we can do yeah. that. Right. There's a lot of people in this community that install these things that they're needing in industrial sites and everywhere that are all certified and qualified. So let's talk about that before we just go. You know, spend the money. No, I mean, I think what we need to do, we need to go on a really a big public relations push and asking for uh, individuals in the community that are skilled in HVAC, skilled in fire sprinkling systems to come in, give us your best deal, and not only does it help you and your business, but it'll help the community as a whole. And I think if we roll this out. Any state grants available? Uh, that's something we'll have to look at to see what grants would be available. And, and would we have to complete one of those studies? I know before no. there was. Not, not for this purpose. Not this. Not. Okay. Yeah. No, we have we have to give them a plan and why we're doing it, but it's <clears> not, you don't have to go through that. Right. The not too stuff. far. Right. Yeah. So if, if what I would do, I would just move one hundred thousand from inmate housing, and I would move it down to account thirty three zero one zero hyphen thirty three ten. Knowing that that's for the annex. And they get detox too for 30 days. I understand it. Right? Being incarcerated for a period of time before they're released. So some will, some won't. It just depends on the person. Like if someone gets on pretrial release and they're doing their drug tests and they're out here waiting for us for a period of six months before they get sentenced, you know, I or whoever has been supervising them can write a letter to the judge and say, look, Johnny Smith's been doing great, showing up to work, you know, consider him for something other than incarceration. Right off the bat. Right off the bat. Right. And not everybody's going to have talent to do anything. <laughs> That's why they're in jail also. <laughs> they didn't go to school. <laughs> yeah, but you know, most people, I'll just tell you, most people that we interview to go to the business manufacturing jobs, I mean, they're not, they all got to be trained. I mean, they oh, that part from manufacturing. You're getting, you're getting people, that, you're getting people that haven't been in jail that still don't have the skill set. So you got to, if you, if you got a good person that's drug free, yeah. you can get them trained. You sure. can get them trained to do what you need to do. That's that we do that all the time. So I don't no, I'm not saying we can't train people. I'm just saying not all of them are going to be trained. Just like we're never going to have uh, full employment. Right. 
lucky we get a patient patient we don't have a dispute on that. We lucky. <laughs> so I, in on the, in on the jail think, or anything else? I think that covers us on the jail at this point. I will say the architect for the DOC said the jail probably has a lifespan of 10 to 15 years, um, which is, uh, I wouldn't say great, but it's better than better than having a lifespan of nothing. All right, so one or two things this morning. One thing the community, everybody needs to understand, there's, there's an inmate population that's got to still go down and down and down before we're even to a point where really where the regional jail becomes a financial break even so that's a, that's one thing to understand right but we're going in that direction but if we want to keep the jail we want to keep things in our control then we got to put the capital necessary to get the, the jail fixed uh, so we need to talk about at some point like this budget cycle maybe next budget cycle creating some reserve capital restricted funds right that we start to set aside those capital funds there for that purpose right so we don't kick that can down the road and we build that up so they can take care of the hot water and all the stuff at the jail that needs to be done so they'll have to create that list right with some numbers and we start putting that aside because that's one example fire department's got the same thing a big truck you got to plan for that you got to put those monies there and have them there and and then when it shows up, you got the money to pay for it. And if the alternative sentencing program works, that's 600000 that can automatically go to fixing some of those big issues at the jail. And if we see it's working this year, we can go ahead and start on some of those projects later in this year as we see this program uh, right. working. So, I mean, that $600,000 that we can say is going to go directly to the jail in order to keep it functional for an extended period of time. What? You said 10 to 15 years? That's correct. Is that as is or is that what? Certain I think that would be as is. That uh, the architect came down from Richmond, and uh, that was his suggestion. Uh, as is, 10, 15 more years of life. life so you life. might, if you did certain modifications, you might could extend that building a little longer. I mean, before the total <coughs> reconstruction. Right. There, uh, you know, we have no cooling system in the jail, so some points. You know, sometime at the temperature back there gets up to 110 points. And uh, the sheriff is going to be, you know, he's not here today because his son's graduating today. Yes. But uh, his concern is we're going to lawsuit the way. Someone dies from a stroke or whatever. Uh, you know, who knows what that But I think we can take care of those things, kind of be the monthly immediate thing that's got to be fixed, like the air conditioner and so forth. And, you know, that's a good example because I'm in the air conditioning business. You know, there are companies out there that will donate that equipment as a tax write-off for that purpose. So we, that's the avenue we need to go down, right, without having to go buy the equipment, right? We just need to somebody to spec it out so we understand the, t the tonnage, what you need, and then we can put a, you know, communication out and we get these big companies that, you know, they have test, they have test equipment all the time. They, they just scrap it. They, they throw it away. I mean, you'd be surprised how much money stone away so what that can solve that that expense in a different way right that's what we got to talk about so we just need to know what they need and then we we'll figure out the best way to get those good things done all right what else anything else on the jail good job guys Excellent job. Thank you. Thank you. Only issue. what are we doing about the school we're going to have all right you're in your schools we're in your schools he's in the I know. Are you? I'm fine. 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 i am fine i am <coughs> if you will look on page expenditures, one forty four on expenditures. Yes. So as you can see, um, it's account 61010. School transfers over the past, uh, in 16, 17 was roughly uh, 
seven million dollars. Uh, we budgeted 17, 18, 6.9 million, and this year we're budgeting 6.86 6, 6 6 million, which is a uh, $225,000 reallocation of funds from the 17, 18 original budget. What happened in the 16, 17? The school had 75 thousand dollars that they didn't need, so to speak. And so they returned it to the city, and we then awarded it to them in the 17, 18 year. So that's where they're coming up with the $300,000. The 225 is the actual number, but the wild 75,000 that the school gave us in the excuse me, 16, 17 year that we awarded to them in 17, 18. So they gave us that money. Obviously, that's in their budget for expenditures. So, as far as they're concerned, they're seeing a three hundred thousand dollar <coughs> shortfall. Well, let's talk about one thing that came up before we get into the, the school. Um, and I don't remember who brought this up. It came up in our discussions about school systems uh, require you pay tuition um, if you live outside the school district. Because if you live outside the school district, you're you're not a taxpayer inside the school district. So if you come in the school district with your kid, you got to pay tuition, right? And tuition rate varies depending on where you know, if you're on the Tennessee side or whatever. So did we ever get information of what tuition rate and how many students in our population are not paying tuition or yes, should we be paying? We did. There's 57 students that are within the city of Bristol schools that are from outside other jurors from other jurisdictions. Do they pay nothing in tuition? Uh, pay hundred dollars, and if you're out of state, you, you pay two hundred dollars. Right. So, um, and then if you have, if you're an employee of the school system, you do not pay anything. Was that reported? I mean, I'm sure that's a benefit. I mean, it's not money now, maybe the minimum, but that should be reported on some. I think that would be a question for the school board. Right, so let me ask this again. So, the, your sure. understanding is that 57 people or students that come into our school system from outside the district. Uh, do not pay any tuition at all, or they pay a hundred dollars. Depending on, and I don't have that breakdown, but if you're from out, if you're out of state, you pay a two hundred dollar tuition. It might be eight or nine. Yeah, yeah, I mean it's not significant than if you're from a. And what does the state, state allow? What does the state yeah. of Virginia allow uh, you to charge tuition? What's their uh, reimbursement? They reimburse my student. Well, now, the state. Okay, so you got three components that make up your school funding, local, state, and federal. The state funds you based on the number of students in your school system. They don't care where your student is from. So those 57 students are allocated uh, roughly $6,000 from the state. So each. Each. Now, locally, basically there is nothing Basically, the, the locality is paying for 57 students that are coming from outside of jurisdiction because we're having to eat that cost uh, and then spread out amongst you know the rest of the students. Like the estimate was like $2,975 somewhere in that neighborhood per student is what we're paying. But the locals are paying. Well, the, in fiscal year 17, uh, locality was 2725. That's what we paid per pupil. So 2725 times 57 students. Is one hundred fifty-five thousand dollars, one hundred fifty-five thousand three hundred twenty-five dollars that the locality is paying for other uh, students, paying for students from outside jurisdictions. Wait a minute, the citizens of Bristol, Virginia, are paying for people from Tennessee or Scott County or Washington County. Is that what you're saying? That's correct. And if you look at Bristol, Bristol, Tennessee schools, I think their tuition rate is eight to nine thousand dollars per student that's coming into their system. Uh, from outside jurisdiction. So they're getting a the gain, you know, from the state, at least, to a certain extent, you can look at it like that. Uh, even though they get 6000 to every student, including local students, I guess they're looking at, like, well, that 2900 we can eat because we're still getting a gain from the state of right. that amount of money. Right. But realistically, now that this has come up and kind of dawned on me, then the school system has a responsibility to not let this fall on the localities, I would say. The school system shouldn't let this fall on the localities. The people that come from out of other jurisdictions, if there's $155,000 that these people can, you know, be billed for and so forth and so on, and should be billed for, especially if you're out of state of Tennessee, 
I mean, you know, I mean, it'd be nice if Tennessee decided they were going to fund them, but they don't do that. Then, you know, part of that three hundred thousand dollars comes right out of that one hundred fifty-five thousand. I mean, you make that three hundred thousand, they need up real quick by just simply going out here and making these people pay tuition. That's just common sense. Because otherwise, you're really taking advantage of the people in the city of Bristol, Virginia. I mean, I, I, that's, that's what I'm trying to get my mind around. I'm not quite there yet, though. So, <laughs> the 57 students, right? Is that calculated? That those are included in the pool of students that's, that the state. That's correct. And the, so the state already sends us how much for each one of those? Probably six thousand for all those students. Six thousand dollars total per, 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 per student. Per student. Per student. So, so without them in the system, they we would lose that six thousand. Well, we just you lose it. You wouldn't necessarily have those students either. So I mean, they're funding you based on number of students. The state says you've got two thousand students in your system. We don't care where they're from. We're giving you six thousand dollars for those two thousand students. Now the question is, out of those two two thousand students, how many of them are truly Bristol, Virginia jurisdiction students? So we'll just round off for easy numbers. 1,940 out of that 2,000 are Bristol, Virginia students. So now the locality is paying for not only those 1,940 that are true Bristol, Virginia students, we're also paying the, for the additional 60 that are not part of Bristol, Virginia's school system. But since the state is paying us a profit on those students, it takes the pressure off of the locality in the sense that the school doesn't have to ask for even more money than they normally ask for. That's correct, except for the fact <clears throat> they could ask for less from the locality if they would charge the tuition rate oh, yeah. of the what we're paying per pupil. So instead of us paying uh, 27 25 per pupil, that tuition could be charged as a tuition rate uh, for out-of-jurisdiction students. And it's absolutely unfair to me that if someone is out of state or out of location, that because they happen to have a teacher that teaches, I don't think that's appropriate to discriminate against the individual that comes in here. I mean, it's just 100, 200 bucks, but you know, 100, 200 bucks, 200 bucks, 100 bucks, and uh, so that policy needs to change. So are we the only? Are we the only municipality that does what we're doing? No, in Virginia, it appears that Virginia's uh, fairly liberal, and at least the school boards in Virginia are fairly liberal when it comes to charging tuition, at least in Southwest Virginia. Uh, you really don't see much of a what I would consider a tuition for an out of jurisdiction student. Uh, most localities waive it or charge a nominal fee like one hundred or two hundred dollars. So if a student from Bristol goes into Washington County, you know there would be a nominal fee for that. Nothing, nothing significant. They find that Washington County is in the same boat that we're in. So now Washington County is going to get an extra six thousand dollars from the state for one of their students being in their in their locale in their local school. And then we'll lose that six thousand. How many of our students that live in the city actually go to the county schools? Um, I've had that discussion with Dr. Perry, and I can't remember off the top of my head. It wasn't. Uh, I, I want to say it almost offset the fifty-seven that we have coming in. Wow. Would, would those have been similar to us employees that they live in the city but they work in? say for Washington County Schools so they're bringing their children there. Right. That's usually what they're reading. Yeah, I mean, that part to me, uh, you know, I, I realize it's a benefit, but I can see why, because we have teachers that get there early in the morning and with all the after school programs and stuff, uh, why they would bring their children there. So I don't know how much <coughs> that reduces that number. I remember talking to Mr. Wingard, his daughter had to pay $9,000 to know that she didn't do it. But she was, that's what she exploded. $9,000 to go to Tennessee schools. So that's kind yeah, of Yeah, $5,000 on my daughter went. <laughs> really? To Tennessee? I moved them into Tennessee. That, that year. <laughs> I mean, it just seems like it would be reasonable that we do what some of, you know, Tennessee schools do. I mean, you know, I mean, if they're coming half kids from over here, and we don't I don't know them. if their state does the same as we do. I, I, don't, think, I, don't, think think it's, I don't think it's funded the same. But I think one thing that the school system could look at is how can they make up the difference in the locality piece uh, on a per student. And I'm not advocating one way or the other, but when you're looking at numbers, the locality is eating $155,000 for students who do not live within Bristol, Virginia. 
we nice they paid some. I mean, realistically, a thousand dollars, maybe slip the baby somewhere and see if they could do that. We could fund some things with that money, perhaps. Well, I don't know. Well, here's where I have, have, have an issue, and, and the numbers are always skewed. It depends on who you ask and how they're feeling that day, I guess. But if the school system has a twenty-seven million dollar budget and they have twenty-two hundred and fifty students, and you divide that. That comes to $12,000 per child to educate inside the city schools. Now the state gives 6,000, so that's half. Now the federal government gives a little portion, I don't, I'm not sure what that is, and then the rest okay, falls on to the locality. Okay, uh, for the city of Bristol, gives $5,479 in fiscal year 17 and the feds gave $1,502 per student. So that's closer to $6,500 per student. And then you also have a state sales tax, which is $1,195 goes to each student. So total that's given through these uh, different funding sources is Okay. Which is, I mean, based on your number, Mr. Wingard, that's, I mean, that's close when you just divide it out per student. So, so the, the state and the federal and all the taxes that's kicked back is totaling $10,910. And $1. And $10,901. Okay. That was fiscal year 17. Okay. And it's estimated that we're paying local per child is $2,900? $2,725. That was this week. All these numbers I'm giving you is fiscal year 17. That's the most up to date numbers. And this is directly from the Department of Education website, superintendents, and the So that's coming up to 13626 per No, the 2725 is included in that 10901 Okay, 2725 is included. So 2725 plus your 1500 federal plus your 5000 Plus your $5,500. $5,479 for the state, and then there's $1,195 for state sales tax. Okay, now, but if you take the 27 million, I mean the, uh, well, and what's, not, what's not included in these numbers is your debt service. So remember, there's about $870,000 of debt service that's uh, involved as well. So when you're taking that 27 million, you need to back off roughly $900,000, which would take you down to about 26 million. Do you have those slides again that the superintendent showed us that showed the total that had to break down over the federal, state, and local? Uh, I, I do. I don't have, uh, I don't know if there's an easy way to get it up there. Right. It's got to be pretty close because if you're getting 10 back from all sources, then you need another. Oh, you said the 27 we were producing is already in that 10 pack. Right, it, it is. So we're losing two thousand dollars on every student they educate. If it's costing twelve thousand, how is that, how is that possible? Well, there's something. Well, there's administrative expenses that you know. I'd say that's try to back out debt, and we back out capital projects too. We back out capital projects debt. Um, there's a, there's about four or five items you've got to back out of that number on that per pupil. So that's going to make up that difference between that ten thousand nine hundred one and the twelve thousand whatever that number is. Right. So you gotta back that out of that budget number. So just read it, can you go through that again? <laughs> um, go through what I just said or go through this? That one. Okay. okay. Um, for state revenue for, well, the budget request for the school board this current upcoming year is $27.2 million. 
The state revenue uh, grant offset is $2.69 million. That was an increase of $147,000 uh, for this past year. Uh, state revenue SOQ, if you give me a second, I'll probably pull it up on email so that we can get it up on the screen. That way everybody's looking at the same thing. But if they don't have that reserve, 
in the first place, then they're not out to anything and leave the 900,000 they got from the state and leave it in their program. What we have to tell the school system is are we behind them building a new school now? And if we say no, they have no reason for the $300,000. Or the 247000 And the two forty seven coming in another year and a half or two. <coughs> so, and that was, uh, I've been told by the superintendent that they're counting on that 247 in addition to this three. And I would like to say this though, the superintendent and I think the entire community was well aware that that 247 was to come back to the city in order to make up the difference in debt. Yeah, that's what we're told. So that didn't mean anything to the school. They still are counting on getting that money to make their plan work. Well, in the 247-200, it's now down to zero because the the capital project that was funded, which was to uh, add men built. Yeah, it, 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 it's back in our budget now. 247-2 is back in our That's budget. because it's complete. That's right. So that, that, that expense, that expense done. went away, so now it's back to us. Which that, that, all, that always happens when a capital project is done at the end, it goes so much head and zero. So that's, that's complete. Okay. So then what you can see, the federal funding uh, this coming year uh, decreased by roughly 62500 And then, of course, the city appropriation for operations, they requested level funding. They did not request the 247,200, and they um, there's other local funds, 505,000. They they get. Of course, also what isn't showing in that school budget is the resource officers that we put in the schools for additional policemen instead of just the one that we used to have. Right. Well, that's, that's not even showing up as a contribution to the schools when in reality that's where they're going. That's correct, because we've got to pay for those school resource officers, because that grants. Uh, and that's going to end this year, is that this correct. year? I think or we have to grant one more year, right. if I'm not mistaken, and so 1920 is when we'll have to pick up. So then school we got to, do you think we're going to be able to pay four resource officers out of school? I don't think so. I won't be here, but I'll come down and scream. Why is the grant, <laughs> why is the grant expiring with everything that's going on in the... Well, and that's the way that it's, it's not saying that they won't reopen a grant, but years ago when they put this school resource officer thing in place, that was one way to uh, incentivize localities in order to have school resource officers is we'll pay for it for X number of years, but you all have to pick it up after that. If you for one year. It up. Right. For one year, you have to pick it up, and then you can either let the school resource officers go or you uh, budget for it yourself. So is that an increase then uh, for this year or next year? There's, it would be for next year's budget. And it won't show up on these numbers. Yeah, it's not showing up in these numbers. Right. And that projection is four? It would be four. I mean, if we keep it as it is, it would be four. So that's a part thousand. Right. I mean, so that's another expense we're going to get to keep. We need to keep that. I mean, that's ridiculous now that we've all the school shootings and all that going on. I wouldn't want to be on council saying, well, we don't need them in the school. So you'll never hear me say that either. I mean, you know, no. school resource officers are poor. So that money is a guaranteed expense. They want another 247 guarantee because without it, they can't do the school. They need the 300,000. Without it, they can't do the school. So what's the answer? Me, I'm sorry as you know what. But finances do not speak well for a new school this time. Now, the city starts booming in other areas that we're not aware of at this point. It can always come back. That partnership thing is always going to be available. They're not going to take it away if we don't do it this year. Well, I think time is everything. Any kind of big project like the school, and I'm not, I'm not for it or against it. I'm going to be. I'm just going to tell people I'm against it until I understand it. Better. And I don't understand at this point. I understand we're, we're going after a private public partnership, right? But like I said earlier, we've not looked at all the other options. Until we look at the other options, I'm a no vote, right? I'm well, just telling you, I'm a no vote on a new school until we look at all the financial options. I'm just looking because at it. Because I'm sitting here looking at, at all the data from these schools sh showing me everything is underutilized, and it has been tremendously underutilized, right? And so. I think there's other things we can do and actually to enhance the education. I mean, I'll just tell you, I'll be fully transparent about it. When you look at how the state funds the 
the standardized testing, right? Schools in this facility do better depending on which school you're talking about, right? And guess which ones do the best on the standardized testing, right? The ones that have the higher student to teacher ratio, the ones at Van Pell, they're doing really well at their standardized testing, right? Third, fourth, and fifth grade, right? So you can't say that lower student ratios help the kids testing because that, let me finish, because that, that says just the opposite. So I'm, I'm trying to be really unbiased about it and understand it. So Van Pelt and a lot of their grades are sitting there at 22 to 1, 24 to 1 ratio, right? I don't use that at 13, 14, 16 to 1. You know, Stonewall. So you see these other schools have really got low ratios, right, compared to Van Pelt, which means these other schools are underutilized. So how can we help those students, right, put them in a, in a better classroom, a better scenario, right, to get their standardized testing up, right? That, to me, is the most important thing to, for them to get a better education now and it's not necessarily, in my opinion, building a new school, right? Now, a new school is one thing to do, right? But that, that's not necessarily the right thing to do. And I'm not against a new school, but timing's everything on a new school, right? So let me tell you another community, and I've told them this twice now, that I'm not going to mention the name of the community. They got out of the box, and they got a private company to step in and give a scholarship program to every single student. And they said, if you go K through 12, and if you graduate through this school system, we will give you a 100% tuition all paid at any, at any university in the entire country, right? And you know what happened to that community? Everybody moved in, real estate values went up, real estate taxes went up, they were able to build a new school, the graduation rate went up, the education test scores went up and everything went the other direction. It's something nobody ever tried before. Nobody ever even talked about that. You know, that's an option that we've got to look at those kinds of options when we're talking about education. It's not just about building a new school. Because at the end of the day, I hope everybody understands that new school means there's going to be a staff reduction. If you're not going to get a new school and keep the same admin staff and the same teacher staff that's out there today, because if you think it true, you're not looking at facts. And, and either you're not being told that now, because that's that's what's going to happen, right? At the end of the day, so there's a lot more to talk about on this new school than this current budget cycle, and so we're not ready, in my opinion, for a new school at all. I just say when you look at the teacher teacher ratios there, to compare Van Pelt and Highland View, I think you know you're looking at one that's probably. A very high poverty school so you're going to have lower teacher ratios because there's a lot that goes into that to help get those kids ready and, and you know i don't use title one and i know that has an impact on the ratios as well so i think that's kind of comparing apples and oranges but i don't think so i will agree to disagree <laughs> well that's i've seen i've seen cases where you take a poverty stricken area and you take some people that didn't have the advantages that the other people had you move them into the advantaged group of people and actually their education rates go up because now they're around people that that uh, have had different uh, experiences through life so if you the worst thing you can do is you pocket this group over here by themselves that's in a poverty community and say well we're just going to keep it that way and not put them with the others that are in the affluent community so i don't agree with that statement you know, it, it's just, it's just not, you're not spending it right. And I've been there and seen it firsthand. So this is going to be, this is going to be a debate. I'm just telling you. And I came on this council for two reasons. One, to get this city in a financial position so we can go forward. And I said, I support education all day long. I love it. But timing's everything. We've got to make sure we, we utilize the current assets properly before we step off into another project like a new school, and then we wake up and it's going to be, people start calling that falls number two, okay? Because we didn't think through it, we didn't debate it from all sides of the Rubik's Cube, we didn't talk about it in all the right ways, right? Because if we talk about it in all the right ways, we'll get the best answer. But just to say it's a new school private partnership, there's no way that that's the right discussion right now. And 
have a no vote until we have the right discussion. Well, I'll say this much. Uh, we're not going to solve these issues today. If this, I don't think collectively we can solve the problems of this school having test scores of this and so forth and so on. But I do think we, we, we know that where the issues are. I still think we're going to have to come back before, not maybe come back, but we're just going to have to visit the fact that we may be in a real significant budget crunch in this city, even with how you guys this thing budgeted, unless we bite the bullet on something else. I mean, I know it's, it's a balanced budget. We've got a few places that we can knock some stuff off, but we're talking potentially some significant down shortfalls in, in revenue and so forth and so on. And how, what is it, we can't tax in the middle of the year. Uh, so what we do if we fall short, the way things are structured right now, right now, and everybody keep this in mind when we meet again, in my opinion, the only way to remedy it, if at the end of a significant revenue shortfall, which I happen to believe is going to happen, then how many people are you going to lay off? Because that's the only alternative you're going to have at that point. Right. Well, I'm going to cut to the chase. If the school, school budget, what part you said was true, that's what I think, is that money was really for this new school thing. I'm going to sit here and tell everybody the budget is the budget. We have the money. We have the money to do what they want to do with this new private. Once we get to that discussion, once all the information is there, we all get to see it, it's not that we don't have $300,000. No. That's not a true statement. That's so, the end of so the money's there. So we set a budget right now for what we know and where we're going. So I think, in my opinion, the 300000 stays out, right? And then when we get more information, when the school system is done with their process, right, and they approach us, we're going to discuss and figure out if, where the money has to come from. So I think the money needs to be set aside. I think it needs to be pushed over into a contingency for the other things that we notice in here might come up. That's it's already out of the budget. Huh? I say it's out of the budget and then it's sore. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's been sore. So I mean, you can still come up with the money later on once you see Well, I guess I said we don't put it back in, is what I'm saying. Yeah. We don't put it back in. One or two years isn't going to kill the new school. We can't. We've yeah. already found some other opportunity, though. Right. But I say that's, that's just, again, opportunity we skewed over here for these contingencies because. I'm still not comfortable looking in the mirror saying we the risk we're risk free because we're not. No, no. I, I still want to talk about uh, the twenty six million divided by two hundred twenty two hundred and fifty students. That comes up to eleven thousand five hundred and fifty five dollars per child, where you said that between local, state, and federal we're funding should be 10,900. Am I correct on that? And that's close enough for how yeah, That's correct. And, and if you take out the debt service and- uh, I took out a million dollars for the debt service instead of 27 million, I run the numbers on 26. Okay, and your number was, what was your number? If you take $26 million right. divided by 2250 on the students, that's $11,555 per child, and you said that the state, federal, and local was 10900 right. Take out the 880000 and once you, once you take that number, there's capital projects, there's debt, there's things that cannot be included in that per pupil ratio. Okay, I need to know what that stuff is. I think so that's that, that answer is something you can do next year. I yeah, mean, well, this discussion right here is for prep for next year. Well, I'm not talking the, the 17, I mean, 1819 year, I'm talking about the 1920. The 1920. To determine if they need to start charging the decent tuition charge. Yeah, because these numbers but that we can't solve that with, here and it's irrelevant for now. I yeah, tell I'm you not you saying that the information is irrelevant. I'm saying that getting the information now is useless to us because we're on a 7 or 18 for right year. now yes but for prep for next year we need to be educated on this I agree. because i'm coming up with 1.4 almost 1.5 million dollar discrepancy between the numbers i'm hearing you're talking about 2017. right these are 2017 numbers this is not so you can, you've got to go back to the 2017 budget to get the number closer to that 10,901. Well, the process needs to be looked at, but it's no no need spending more right. time on it now because that's not going to be in our budget. Right. That's all I'm saying. I've got to go to a funeral. I've got to get mother to you. <laughs> I have my mother to you. Okay, so we'll. Uh...
All right, so let me just do a quick recap yeah. real quick. So I know we're going to wrap uh, for May 22nd because that's going to be the first reading. Uh, Before you get there, we're going to have to have another workshop. Yeah. Right, okay, yeah. that's what I was going to ask. Yeah. So we so, need to set one, maybe one night next week. Well, we've, we've, got, we've got a call meeting on Tuesday uh, to deal with uh, the Sunset BBU transfer. That will be this coming Tuesday. That's the only thing I have on the agenda. We can have another. Uh, we'll have another discussion have meeting for an hour or two. Tuesday night. Usually not. Okay. Well, you have to announce that as well. Maybe. We've already done that. Okay. I meant you've announced the, the purpose of the special call meeting. Yeah. It's that one thing. We we'll we'll talked about something out. Yeah. But now we'll have a budget workshop. I think we can set a budget workshop at another time after that. Oh, okay. And not the same night. night. Right. No, on the same night. No, we haven't It'd be on the same night. You'd have to call the meeting. And then okay. after, that meeting, after that meeting, after that meeting, we're just going to do a budget workshop. Well, as long as we announce it, that's all right. Can you recap? Tuesday night instead of now, please. I'll look the pleasure of counsel, you Please, don't leave your What's that? It won't take me two minutes. Overtime, overtime, I'm pulling out half of overtime. The city attorney position will reduce it by 75,000. I'm gonna look into the Commonwealth Attorney lease. I'll give you all more information on that. Sheriff's Department, we're moving 100,000 from inmate housing over to the maintenance of property and buildings. And at this point, we'll leave the school budget as it stands. That is good, that's pretty good. All right. <laughs> I told you to be quick. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. We want this door open here. No, that's probably closed. Uh, probably need to adjourn the meeting. Okay, Mayor. No, I'm sorry. <laughs>